Hey everyone, Matt Lanford here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. This is Modcast number 107. It's another Gun Nerds episode, Gun Nerds 8. We're going to be talking about 308 gas guns. Uh, really cool panel to discuss this. A lot of experience. We also have uh, a history aspect that we're going to be covering, which is going to really frame where we're at now. Um, it, it should be an exciting and educational episode. Uh, right now we are live on Spreaker uh, and also on on YouTube. It will this will be available immediately on Spreaker. Um, so if you're on YouTube and you're driving around, switch over to Spreaker on primary and secondary channel, and you'll be able to listen live and not get pulled over for having uh, iTunes or uh, YouTube playing. And uh, it will take up less less data. It will also save your battery just a little bit longer because that's important. My background's in law enforcement, um, firearm stuff, video games, all the usual. Yeah, I think I say the same thing every episode. I think I probably need to stop now. I think I'm going to have the panelists now say who they are and what they're about. Let's start with Chuck. Uh, Chuck P., 26-year Army veteran, recently retired, uh, special ops guy, now currently a consultant to the industry and a firearms trainer, both closed and open enrollment for citizens, cops, and military. And Jordan. You guys may know me from my uh, internet alter ego, Randy Broshenkel, Carnicon fame, uh, but I think the pertinent detail tonight is uh, my 10 year experience of designing uh, ARs and whatnot, and I've actually done the entire uh, kind of reverse engineering and TDP workup on a you know three eight SR twenty five style gun. So uh, I I know all the all the nitty gritty stuff. I think it's going to be a while until people are going to recognize you from this compared to Carnicon, unfortunately. And let's see here, we have Ian. Yep. I'm Ian McCollum. I do. I run ForgottenWeapons.com. I have been nowhere and done nothing real, uh, but I read a lot of books and I've handled some weird guns. And you're well known for that. And then apparently, so, yeah, apparently, yeah, I'm yeah. kind of a big deal on the internet. It's almost yeah. Uh, or so I'm told. A, oh no, yeah, memes and all kinds of stuff. It's it's impressive. And then we have Jack. Oh, you're muted. Okay, I feel like I'm not muted anymore. You are not muted anymore. All right, so uh, Jack, I've uh, done some military stuff. Uh, nothing super special. I like shooting guns and uh, work at nights. No more than that? Yeah, you know, I've been on the internet and I'm a veteran of the Cola Wars, but other than that. Okay, that works. So... We discussed prior to starting, we're going to go with a little bit of history, frame where we're at now. Ian, take it away. All right, now that I found the mute button. <laughs> uh, so basically, the 308 cartridge evolved uh, in the early 1950s. At the end of World War II, there was a lot of push to, uh, to design some new small arms. And the U.S. in particular wanted to replace, basically replace everything in the inventory with one do-it-all firearm. And that was, would eventually become the M14, which was intended to replace the grease gun, the M1 Garand, and the BAR, all in one package. Um, and to do this, they needed a cartridge for it. The 30 6 was ballistically satisfactory, but it was a very long cartridge, 63 millimeter case length. And with powders that were available by the 1940s and 50s, it was technically feasible to have basically the same ballistics uh, with a substantially shorter cartridge case. And so a shorter case meant uh, a slightly shorter weapon, meant a lighter weapon. If you imagine taking about a half of an inch slice out of the receiver, uh, you know, all the big chunky bits of an M1, that's not a trivial amount of weight. It's not a lot, but it's more than some people might think. 
So they wanted to develop a new cartridge to basically optimize uh, 30-06. At the same time, NATO was looking to standardize a cartridge across all of its membership. And ultimately, what they wanted to do was standardize wanted to standardize a lot, actually, uh, small arms. And in theory, at the beginning, they wanted to standardize a lot of other equipment. All of that would kind of fall apart, probably as a result of the failure to be able to standardize on even an infantry rifle. Uh, but the very first step in this whole process was standardizing on an infantry rifle cartridge. And the two main contenders that came into NATO trials uh, in the basically the very early 50s uh, were the T-65, which was the early developmental iteration of what would become 7.62 NATO, and then the British 280 uh, cartridge. And what really had gone on here was the British had gotten the lesson from two world wars that combat really didn't take place at extended ranges. And so they, they got rid of this idea of trying to shoot at 1,000 or 2,000 meters or yards, and they scaled back and they decided to develop a cartridge specifically for effectiveness at 600 uh, meters and in. And that was the 280. It was, uh, I probably should have written down the exact details, but it was uh, 130 uh, grain bullet at about 2,450 feet per second, as I recall. So it was not, it, it, a lot of people refer to it as an intermediate cartridge. I'm not sure it quite qualifies as that. It's not really anything like a 5.56. It's really kind of like a lighter version of a full power rifle cartridge. It's similar to like the Italian and Japanese 6.5 cartridges in terms of energy and, and general ballistics. And the idea here was something that was that produced less recoil, you could carry more ammunition, you could shoot more effectively uh, at those ranges where combat actually did take place in exchange for giving up the potential for 1,000 or 2,000 yard effectiveness. Now, the the whole trials program was based on an idea of terminal ballistics. Um, that's what one of, well, that was one of the criteria was whatever cartridge they adopted had to meet the standard for being lethal at whatever standard was decided. And the US kind of, I don't want to say rigged the trials, but the trials were in some ways predetermined by the fact that people agreed to use the US standard of ballistic effectiveness, which was, believe it or not, uh, it needed a bullet needed to have 58 foot pounds of energy. That's 80 joules at 2,000 yards, and uh, 58 foot pounds was kind of the number that had been agreed to as a standard for lethality. The idea was um, there hadn't been a lot of research into a lot of formal research into bullet lethality at this point, and so it's an extremely difficult field even today to really set a standard for what what makes a bullet or a piece of shrapnel lethal. Well, there's a ton of different factors that go into it. And the U.S. had kind of just internally agreed to this simplified version of if a projectile has 58 foot-pounds of energy, it is lethal, and if it has less than that, it is not lethal. So I think if you look at it this way, the mistake that the British on the, the British delegation to the NATO trials made was they decided to accept that standard for lethality and try and make the 280 cartridge match it which it sort of technically was able to, but then it was clearly the inferior cartridge based on that criteria. And so um, at first there was, well, as the trials went forward, there was basically a, a tacit agreement or a agreement reached that the British would give up their cartridge um, and accept the US T-65 or 762 NATO um, in exchange for the US accepting the European rifle, which was at that point the FN FAL. Um, and then the U.S. kind of did a, uh, whoop, nope, never mind, we're just going to use our own rifle and our own cartridge, and you guys can go do whatever, but you're, you're bound by an existing agreement to use the cartridge that we agreed to already. And at the end of that, uh, the U.S. had the M14. Uh, by the way, there was originally an M15 as well that was going to be like the light automatic rifle version um, that was ditched because it was just ineffective, um, and the M60 replaced it. Uh, anyway, the U.S. had the M14 to replace the BAR and the submachine guns and the M1 carbine, and most of uh, the rest of NATO ended up with the FN FAL. Where did 58 pounds come from? It was just a, they just threw a dart? Right there. Yeah. Um, I don't have all the details on the early terminal ballistic studies that resulted in that, and they were pretty obviously flawed. Um, if you use that number, 
you'll see that uh, like very small pieces of shrapnel can't possibly have enough velocity if they weigh too little, and yet they can very easily be fatal. Uh, and if you looked at, at the time, if you look at um, statistical casualties based on the, the size of the lethal fragment that was responsible for the casualty, you'll see that the numbers just do not jive with that 58 foot pounds of energy requirement. But at the time, the US was, there wasn't a whole lot of other research being done in that field. There were very few um, actual studies of casualties from previous wars. And there just, there weren't a whole lot of other options to go with at the time. Uh, there have been since, uh, there've been much better models developed since, but it's still, it, even today, it's still a tricky field, you know? A little tiny pellet that hits your spine can kill you, and a big chunk of metal that bounces off your arm can not do anything. You know, uh, an interesting aspect to this is how this also kind of draws, or it kind of calls back on previous episodes we've had, how uh, war fighters have determined, you know what, we're not fighting at these distances anymore. It's not necessary. Let's, let's pull it in. And it seems that that's currently a hot topic. And unfortunately, it sounds like we're not going in the logical direction. <laughs> One of the really interesting bits of research that was being done by Britain and also to some extent the U.S. at this point was looking at whether it was even feasible, you know, at what ranges soldiers could even make hits. And a lot of the, the studies that were done determined that beyond 100 yards, even pretty well-trained, effective, capable uh, soldiers were statistically incapable of making hits on a moving target beyond 100. And Come so, <clears throat> <laughs> uh, interestingly, what that led to in the US, I'm getting a little bit off topic here, but it's a fascinating area of exploration to me. That led some of the US uh, projects into the, the Salvo and the SPEW projects of if these guys, if, if we can't really train people well enough to hit a moving target, what if we just give them some sort of mechanical firearm solution that that blasts a whole bunch of projectiles all at once. They can't make a precision aim shot, but it doesn't matter because we'll, they'll be more likely to, to hit something if they're firing three shots or five shots simultaneously. Crazy. Basically, basically 300 yard shotguns. Yeah. We have two new panelists that just jumped on with us. Ray, quick yeah, little yeah. hi. Ray Miller, 82nd Master Gunner, just here. A uh, little bit of experience with the 308 gas gun. Not much. Most of it's with SAS. Uh, apart from that, John can speak way better on that than I can. And take it away, John. Hey, how's it going? John Brady here. I'm with uh, 10th Mountain Division currently. Uh, background is extensively in long range. A uh, lot with 308, old school. Uh, sniper guy and uh, still currently doing that a little late to the party because I was loading my truck up to go blast tomorrow so hey how's it going first time on this chat so hope I can join in oh yeah we're, we're gonna have a good time cool especially I, I've already warned people that there might be some m14 hate <laughs> yeah especially when ash gets here oh I know that guy loves it so much he does so we have the M14. That was our, our solution for the time. The, uh, the AR-10 then was developed. Jack? Oh, you're muted. It was developed, and then it blew a bullet through the side of its barrel, and it was dropped from, tri from trials. Wait, now, uh, yeah, go ahead. Want to get I mean, there's you know Jack may get into it. there's a bit of a gap between you know the 50s and you know uh, and the AR10 you know to the uh, you know the, the SR25 there um, you know the uh, the AR10 actually I mean people actually use the AR10 like the old school ones um, it found some you know it found some ground in uh, with the Portuguese and the the Cubans and the Dutch. Um, I don't know if we want to talk more about that. If it if it brings us to our modern solutions, yeah. Well, so I think it's a really interesting thing when you look at what goes on with the um, 
the the AR10 transition into what's happening now and and where we wound up with the 25. You know, you took the the AR10, which is a 308 gun initially, um, you know, and then that basically just got changed over to a 556. Um, you know, pretty much in in the same form factor. And then when we actually moved it over into a 7.62, uh, it got bigger. Um, you know, it's I, I think it's certainly looking at the time when it was made. That's probably a an interesting reason on why or what we have in 7.62 is the size that it is. Yeah, that's that's one of the things is like the uh, the original AR-10s are, yeah, I think um, I haven't got to play with any, but uh, they're phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, they're they're light um, and they're, yeah, I think on the whole they are a little bit uh, smaller than, than what uh, we know of the SR-25, like LR-308 kind of pattern nowadays. Um, yeah, I also thought it was funny that the, uh, maybe getting ahead of ourselves here, but that transition to like the modern 308, uh, we kind of rescaled the AR-15 up rather than go take a step back and kind of do an AR in, back at the original AR-10s. You know, part of that was there was this huge logistics train of AR-15 parts there. So let's try and use some of those. Um, that's probably all it, all it did. I don't know. I hear there's a museum out there that has all this stuff about this i've been looking for it but it's it's all rumors <laughs> no i mean it's it's pretty cool you know i've been able to take out some of those old original especially like the dutch guns um really cool guns you know you, you pull them off the wall and it's just it's amazing what they weigh um you know you look at the, at the parts and the piece and the way they fit together and, you know they're i mean it's one it goes back to that era of just precision and machining that they were able to pull off um, it's almost surprising to see it today, which is kind of sad. Um, but you know, when, when you get beyond that, like getting the guns out, I mean, they, they had really thin barrels and, you know, they, they had kind of some of the, you know, they were subject to what they were and what they're made at the time. But, uh, you know, when you take those guns off the rack and you put it down and look to iron sights and then you, you blast in a, you know, a five round one hole group and you're just like, man, what, did, what is going on with this? You're like, why is this happening right now? Um, you know, and, and he becomes an effect and things change, you know, and, you know, nobody at the time was shooting the way that we shoot today. I mean, you know, 5,000 rounds, yeah, maybe over the life of, you know, 10 years in service, you know, whereas today we do that in, what, two months of real training? Um, but it's, it's it's certainly interesting in what it was. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's one of the things with the uh, um, kind of that – I'll turn the lux on. The uh, – the old school armalites as a whole, their whole mythos or philosophy to guns, you know, yeah, the, you know, original AR 10s was, you know, six pounds and some change, I think. No. Yeah. They got, they got heavier quick. Uh, once they started, you know, using them for real, like, you know, the Dutch guns and stuff, it's like, okay, yeah, this aluminum swage barrel stuff ain't going to work. You know, let's go, you know, full ordnance steel and, and, uh, and, and whatnot. Um, yeah. And, and is, uh, uh, we talked about earlier the you know the ar10 did have its head was given i don't know some shot at at that whole uh 308 rifle business uh there in the 50s and 60s and it was just too early. the gun just wasn't matured enough to to stand a chance there apparently the dutch ones aside from you know dutch service and portuguese and cuba and whatever and angolia you know, that's okay. That's kind of small stuff, but they, uh, you know, as the story goes, got pretty damn close to, uh, being the, uh, the, um, West German, um, battle rifle. Um, I think they, uh, like those more than the G, what would become the G threes. Um, but there was no way in hell that, uh, the Dutch were going to be able to make them fast enough for, you know, the deal with the, the potential Soviet horde. So they, you know, went with their stamp steel German guns that they could crank out a lot faster. Yes. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Run with that. Uh, so uh, to to try and keep us on track, I would say there there were two main reasons that the 308 was was kept or was used as a major cartridge. And one of them was lethality uh, or 
apparent purported lethality. Um, the other was as a machine gun cartridge. And this is something you see when the British were, were looking into SA-80 and how they wanted to do their replacement for the, the FAL. Uh, and the, the question was, you need a heavier cartridge or you can make use of a heavier cartridge in a machine gun uh, where you're, you're talking belted ammo, you're often, not always, but often talking about having the, the gun mounted on a vehicle or in a static position. And you can exploit, you can use a tripod to exploit the longer potential range of a heavier cartridge and the weight isn't as much of a factor. However, if you want to have one standardized cartridge for rifles and machine guns, then you're looking at the question of, do we have a, a, a cartridge that's ideal for a machine gun or do we have a cartridge that's ideal for a rifle? So what, what 762 NATO is, is an ideal machine gun round that is substantially too powerful for the individual rifle because it makes full auto fire infeasible uh, without a huge amount of training and practice. And it means you can't carry nearly as much ammunition. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at what the British did with SA-80, they decided to use 5.56 for both the, the squad automatic weapon and the rifle, and they end up with a squad automatic weapon that is perhaps underpowered and underranged. Now, we've been talking a lot about that lately, you know, yeah. the difference between the automatic rifle and the, you know, light machine gun and whatnot. Though, you know, with that AR-10, you could have had both, you know, the whole weapon system belt fed up or ready to go. Tell you what, when I shot when when I shot an original AR-10, when I pulled the trigger on full auto, the whole world just kind of went gray until I let let go of the trigger. <laughs> so what, what I was getting into is is I think that there really is kind of a um, disproportionate idea of what machine guns do, um, and and what's necessary for the effectiveness of a machine gun. Um, you know, I mean, it's like really not since. World War One has really been the, the emplacement of machine guns in a conventional force, huge man killer. You know, I mean, it's employed to deny terrain and make your enemy change their idea of exactly what they're doing. Um, you know, pretty much the point at which you're killing a whole bunch of dudes with a machine gun means that you've got a really dumb enemy. And, and th that happens. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to argue that. Um, but, you know, it's, I think you can get away with a lot on machine guns because of volume. Um, and that doesn't really come into play, especially with an individual man portable weapon where you've got to carry all that stuff. You've got to carry all that ammo. You know, you've got to make that choice of, you know, am, am I going to take another magazine or another battery for my radio? Or am I going to take, you know, another bag of IV fluid? You know, like what, what really makes sense? And, you know, as much as we want to, you know, rail against 5.56, five, you know, since 2001, um, you know, at the end of the day, that thing's put a lot of dudes in the dirt and not because it's an effective car, uh, cartridge or caliber. I think you're going to find there's a, there's a large amount of fanboys for five, five, six here compared to three Oh eight. Oh, absolutely. Oh. Yeah. Chuck. Yeah. I got, I got nothing. No, I, I'm, I, it's, it's cool because, uh, I'm hearing the same information from another source. And as we've said in the past, there are some, some commonalities. There are some truths that no matter your background, you're going to come to it. And there's one. Uh -huh. Absolutely. You know, you look at another way of, you know, what's, um, you, know, you, you look at, it, at all your lethality studies, like every lethality study starts with a hit. And the more opportunities you have to hit, the more hits you tend to get. Well, uh, one of our posts just came up. Um, is the ORO, ORO did a study back in 1952 and found that a 22 bullet was just as lethal as 30 cal, you know, or 308, we should say. So if it's just as lethal, now granted that's not an armed threat or armored threat, I should say. If I can carry more rounds, and as uh, previous modcast, you have the spoiler rounds, they're a thing, then if I'm doubling my ammo capacity with 5.56, five, if I'm not engaging a target out past 600 meters where terminal ballistics start to take a play, I, I, I don't see in bringing in 7.62. 
Um, and if you're dealing with terminal ballistics and you've got a better round than the M80 ball, okay, maybe there's an argument there. John, what are your thoughts? Sorry, I'm trying to work this thing first time on here. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that anything when you get past, like you said, 600 with that 5.56, five, when you get terminally, the, the wound cavity obviously is going to be bigger with the 308, so it's going to cause more disruption. But even when you're shooting an M80 with 147 grain, it's not even going to be as accurate as range. It's going to be almost as accurate as shooting, you know, a 5.56, five, you know, depending upon wind conditions for the day or whatnot. Um, I think that, you know, like you said, anything that can be hit, <laughs> anything worth shooting once is worth shooting multiple times. And if you can do that with five, five, six and, you know, get more rounds on target, then awesome. Now you talk wind, if you're talking extreme ranges for shooting, even at 600, you know, anything over a four mile an hour wind with five, five, six, if you're holding center mass is going to blow you off target verse with 762, you'll still be on target at that point. So now you're talking about training soldiers or people to, you know, evaluate wind at those ranges. Well, granted, and the it, the 762 would be more forgiving at that point, but I think that's the only real benefit it provides is yeah. it's providing a hardware solution that overcomes our software problems that we currently have right now. Um, right. You know, but that's at 600 meters. But like many of our panelists have pointed out, um, in previous discussion, you know, 200 and in is where we, we, you know, the studies have shown 200 and in is where we own the fight. So if it's not providing a terminal effect, then I, I just, we're, we're, we're beating it dead. Absolutely. 100%. Wow. I saw a really interesting study that the U.S. military did uh, in the 50s based on geography um, and, and assessing or trying to assess how far could a prone soldier actually see a standing enemy in general. And they analyzed a bunch of different geographic locations and came to the conclusion that 70% of the time you can't even see a person 300, more than 300 yards away. And I think 95% of the time you are limited to 700. So the idea of having anything that's effective farther than that is almost impossible just from the perspective of you can't, you don't have line of sight to a potential target at that range. I, and I, I totally agree. The, the main thing is like, uh, I know John, when, uh, when he taught down at sniper school, I went through one, one of his classes, you know, we're sitting there doing range estimation and we're doing it in perfect conditions. And granted, you want to do that to learn how to estimate the range to your target. But 600 meters across a bowling alley of a KD range or a drop zone is going to be look different than 600 meters of uneven terrain or terrain with trees. Hell, you might even be able to see 600 meters depending upon what the terrain is offering you. So, yeah, I can see the argument there as to being able to identify the range effectively and being able even to see out past 200. Well, we are also have, we have been discussing magnified optics also, not only for, for military, but also law enforcement solutions as, and I brought this up in the past, a lot of military solutions end up being also a, a, a law enforcement solution as well. So magnified optics on patrol rifles are, are a normal thing. So would that, well, that does ex basically extend our, our effective range. So what is the yeah. ability to effectively identify? It doesn't do a whole lot for actually grabbing hits a lot of times I've seen. Um, you know, especially like, you know, I shoot a whole lot of still targets out of really far distances. And I have a, I'll run my magnified optic up at around 13 powers, kind of my normal kind of standard thing, in order to actually watch an impact or watch an impact on steel. And that's a wide open, super easy target. It doesn't get easier than that. And if you're running anything less than that, you're not seeing what you're hitting or what you're not hitting. True. If there's a hill between you and the other guy, no amount of magnification is going to solve that problem. Yeah, I'll tell you that, like, a lot of discussions that I've had with people regarding 5.56 and 3.08 and stuff like that, in my personal opinion, with a lot of stuff is 
it's just another tool, <laughs> you know, and I don't know, like, can you weigh that one's better than the other or, you know, I mean, there's that that's why obviously we're having this huge discussion about this stuff tonight, you know, but I think there's a tool for everything. You know, if we're looking at like both, both my deployments were to Iraq, a lot of urban fighting. Yes. I've, ex I've shot at extended ranges. I've shot out 1300 meters in an urban environment, rooftop to rooftop with an M14, Shh, watch out. But what I'm saying is that, you know, you look at the urban fight, a lot of room clearing, a lot of streets, you know, 300 meters in standard engagement for snipers. But, um, you know, you go to Afghanistan, it's a lot further. You look at city streets. I'm in upstate New York. Yeah, you're not going to get a lot of extended ranges out here unless it's from cornfields and whatever, but then you're going to need to identify people. So, you know, my, my opinion, the difference between five, five, seven, Hey, just my little soapbox is that I think both of them are great. They both have their applications. And, you know, I don't think that one is a better tool than the other, in my opinion. So currently, what are our what are the main main options that we have then for an effective modern 308 gas gun? <laughs> I think we've got some a little bit of ground to cover there real quick. Okay. Yeah. Um, Not the sass. <laughs> uh, just to, I think you get everyone up to speed on, you know, it's not just like, they're not just one type of, uh, you know, like say AR-10, right? That's a, that's a, that's a messy bag of weeds now. Um, so m I don't know of any, any of the original like AR-10 uh, variants that actually kind of live through to modern times, right? Um, they pop all, up in places, but not yeah, yeah, they, formal they exist, units. But they're not. There's no one's actually using them. They're all collectors, that, and there's no one making parts and s supporting them anymore. Well, they uh, show up in weird places in Africa, being well, used. What doesn't show up group. in weird exactly. places in Africa? <laughs> yeah. The uh, I want to show up in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> the. Uh, so, what was it? You know, kind of early '90s. You know, the SR25. Um, you know, that may have actually got to start in the late '80s, but it was early '90s when it, you know, became a thing. Uh, and then you also had the the fake Armalite and Eagle Arms Armalite, uh, and their AR10s, um, which there's definitely some. They were looking at an SR twenty five when they when they did that, uh, but they were willing to deviate um, from that a bit. You know, those original or the Illinois uh, Armalite AR tens. You know, all used modified M fourteen mags. Uh, their bolt carriers were a little different. The receiver lengths were a little different. Uh, the uh, handguard, the barrel nut thread pattern and stuff are a little different. But there's it's all more or less the same sort of package it was just kind of the bigger it was more or less the same envelope as the sr 25s um and then you had the dpms lr 308s uh which are just straight up well, aside from the 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 uh, receiver profile between the upper and lower are just straight up clones of the sr 25 um you know uh worked over to be a little cheaper to make um, but that's basically, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty damn close in terms of parts commonality. Not that I'd be swapping DPMS parts in my nights or something or vice versa, but, uh, it's, it's not that far off. You could probably do it. Um, now th then you have the, the weirdo rock river and Bushmaster Frankenstein things that tried to use FAL mags or just, you know, a dumpster fire of a, of a gun. Um, and then, uh, your other LR three hundred eight clones and SR twenty five clones that have kind of spawned in this kind of contemporary market, um, and now you're starting to see the small frame three hundred eights, which what DPMS is actually probably the closest thing to a modern old school uh, AR ten. Um, so there's kind of I guess the market rundown. Um, what was the uh, the first um, 
military R10. I guess the the Mark 11s. No. They the they, some had some SR 25s. They're actually just straight up SR 25s. Yeah. To my knowledge, SR 25s. Yeah. Yeah. They're the, like uh, carbon fiber, fucking circular four ends, uh, and and then replaced by the original 1913 models, but but neither. Uh, type spec and, and crane programs of record. Uh, the as they proliferated and quality control became a concern, crane basically, you know, SOCOM was like, well, if we had some type of quality control, blah 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 blah. blah. So the Mark 11 program was the uh, your traditional SF teams and your white seal platoons and all these people wanting uh, a capability that they had seen around but had never played with uh, or had only played with in limited numbers. And so by making it a program of record, uh, those guns actually left Florida and every rifle had to go to Crane and had to be test fired at Crane and then get Crane seal of approval with rounds in the data book and then zip tied back shut in its Pelican case, and then sent down to the property book officer of the receiving unit. I know this because I bought Mark 11s uh, when I spent that $29 million my first year at AWG. And I got my brand new shiny, nobody else had ever fired it other than Crane Mark 11 right out of the Pelican case in Mosul, Iraq in 2005. Um, and it had issues. And that's when we realized that <laughs> Nobody had budgeted for Crane to shoot M118 or M118LR during all these tests. So when I looked in the data book, it was fucking M80 that had gone through the gun uh, flawlessly. Uh, so my, my, my first, you know, uh, 200 and something round break in of my precision semi-automatic sniper system was was some dude jamming mags and, and burning through them in a, wherever at, at Crane. So. Road to hell is paid with the best intentions. That, that, that comes in kind of an interesting point of, um, you know, where, where Knights came into it. I happen to know some stuff. Um, but uh, it, it's straight in line with that. Um, and that, you know, the – I can't remember exactly when Knights took over the the test firing of that and the, and the acceptance test requirement. Um, but it went into exactly what you said. It, they, they had to go 200 rounds of uh, test fire. Um, just the function test. So each magazine, because it came with 10 magazines, uh, 20 rounds each, had to go through with zero stoppages, no, no issues, and then into an accuracy test, which brings into another interesting thing of barrel break-in and what's happened with the gun. Um, and those are held to a really tight acceptance standard, um, especially based off of what was happening at the time. Um, and that, you know, back then, you know, you're looking at a gun that was required to hold sub-minute um, with, uh, with two groups being sub-minute. Um, you know, the suppressed and unsuppressed with so less than 1.1 shift. So, uh, I'm sorry, 3.14 shift. Um, so, a uh, interesting kind of data point in, in how many rounds are going through that barrel before it ever saw a user. Excuse me. I got yard workers at the door. <laughs> you know, and, and the, the accuracy thing, in my experience of making – you know, 308 ARs um, is not as easy to come by um, on the AR-10s as they are uh, the 5.56 five, guns. Um, it's There's definitely some more voodoo to it um, or something. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I actually ever 100% figured it out. Um, but it's definitely, definitely more of a challenge to... Uh, to get you know a sub sub uh, MOA uh, AR10 variant um, than it was uh, you know AR15. We have a bunch of uh, primary and secondary mods that refuse to have anything to do with this this topic because they've had such bad luck with exactly that top with that 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 concept that actually getting an accurate 308 gas gun is it takes a lot of work. Well, it takes a lot of work as a shooter. Yeah, you know, which I think brings us right back to what this real discussion is of, you know, I mean, we're coming down to, you know, I mean, this is all about a army proposition to go and arm a whole bunch of dudes with a 7.62 gun without a whole lot of training behind it. 
Well, in in what little experience I have with it, um, started off in sniper school and we had the M24s. And the 24, great gun. I mean, you could shoot that thing for days. Hell, a trained monkey could shoot that gun and have no problems, you know? The, the 24 was a solid bolt action gun. And we had, were one of the first classes that was transitioning to the 110. And when we got the 110, your mistakes in your shot process showed up a hell of a lot more rapidly and were a lot less unforgiving. The 24 was a very, very reliable gun, but it also was very easy to shoot. Whereas the 110 scaled up you know, a lot of them just thought it was a scaled up M4 and tried shooting it the exact same way. And that led to a lot of the problems initially, like pinning the trigger, pinning the trigger on the SAS initially was leading to double fires because of the way that trigger was set up. And, you know, if, if you just sat there and took the AR uh, or took your M4 techniques and shot that it's the exact same way, it, it yeah, it would not be forgiving. And it would definitely show up in your position because guys would sit there and not get behind the gun the way that they would with an M4 and think they'd be okay and were surprised when that thing jumped out of their shoulder. Yeah, when we did the uh, J snipe them test down at AWG, <laughs> uh, some Air Force guys that were out there who had, uh, they went through their Air Force sniper course and they didn't even – they were so ill-trained that they were unaware that an M24 would hold five rounds internally. They only thought it was one round at a time. And these guys with no training, with <laughs> a 30 minutes in the classroom at AWG's compound, they were out shooting us, experienced guys, with M110s. <laughs> I mean, that gun is just – something else but it was it was amazing to see that i mean for them to have i think we had a 19 percent hit rate at a thousand meters uh on moving targets from two four and eight miles per hour sub minute of angle targets 19 percent hit rate <laughs> on moving targets it was something insane So, um, and I think that was one other thing is just, um, when you look at the, the gas gun, the AR platform is a lot of the, the leeriness from, I'm not sure on the law enforcement side, but I could imagine it would be this way. They started off with 24s. So transitioning from a 24, just like we did in the mil in your military, you go from that bolt gun to a gas gun and there's, there's a little bit of a learning curve there. And I think uh, what you're encountering Matt is folks that, you know, they're, they're set in their ways and they don't want to sit there and learn something new. And that just goes back into a training problem. Yeah. Remington seven, Remington seven hundreds are <coughs> at least in this area seem to be it for a sniper weapon. Uh, one of my old departments wound up picking up a LaRue OBR, which, was awesome, uh, but this was I don't know how many years ago. Um, I I heard that that sucker was out shooting a lot of the the seven hundreds, but it might have just been due to training and uh, upkeep of the seven hundreds. Hi, Mike. Do you have any uh, any interesting things to to add to this so far? You're muted. I uh, just listening. Um, like like we discussed earlier, I don't I don't really have any time behind a 308 gas gun. Pressed a couple triggers here and there, but you know more of a fam fire type thing. Uh, this is a, a pretty different subject for me. Yeah. <laughs> not being not being a sniper. But given the uh, the RFP that went out for an interim rifle, this is something that we definitely should be interested in. And I think because of that, because of your background with this, it makes you a, a perfect panelist because you can ask some of these questions listeners are thinking of. Um, yeah. Rick, you're here. 
Tell us about your gas gun experience, 308 gas gun. Hey guys, um, most of it, the vast majority of it is with the, the uh, M110 uh, SAS uh, as, uh, as we get issued in the Army. Um, I have played a little bit with uh, some uh, older SR25s and a few of the civilian AR-10s out there on the market, but obviously, you know, those are onesies and twosies here and there. Um, I don't have a whole lot of experience with the, um, the various incarnations of uh, 308 gas guns. It's all, uh, all just about all of its M110 stuff. Is the SCAR-17 anything even to consider in these in this category? I, I haven't touched one uh, to... I mean, I've got to mess around with it, you know, uh, but I don't have a whole lot of experience with it. I couldn't really comment to that. Um, you know, just not, it hasn't been in my lane. What do you want it to do, Prime? I mean, uh, the SCAR, uh, precision SCAR variant is fairly, fairly capable. I would not... Old Matt Jake, he's going to kick me in the kneecap next time he sees me. I wouldn't take one over uh, uh, a one of the new 16-inch uh, Knights guns or an OBR. Um, I, I just I, I wouldn't. Th those guns, uh, those guns when they're running are man, they're, they're hard to uh, they're hard to beat. I'm glad that uh, Hodnet really got into. And I'm sure other people have done it before, but it was Todd that really kind of hit the military community about, hey, man, let's tighten this rifling up and chop some of this barrel off. And I think what you're going to give up in terms of accuracy is going to be acceptable for how much more versatile the platform is and, and how much you're dealing with the weight savings. When you look at a 20-inch uh, full boat SAS or the older Mark 11 with a Yolk can on it, man, that's a musket. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you're if you're trying to fight your way into a pause uh, in an urban environment, that thing that thing's a musket, um, and, and all the weight that comes with that. But I can get 90% of the performance out of a 16-inch Knight's gun that I can out of a full boat uh, 110. If it's if it's doing its part, if if you know I've taken care of it and I've got you know I've got it tuned up like I like it, 16-inch uh, uh, Knight's gun or uh, or one of Mark's uh, old guns, man. I got like OBR serial number something, like old as fuck. That gun is a tack driver. It is an absolute tack driver. So um, I, I really see that, that uh, scar in kind of a more of a battle rifle uh, realm, Matt. Uh, you know, it's one of those kind of break glass in case of war type things. If you're going to, if you are the designated dick that has to still assault, but you get into a long range gunfight, you're that guy like squad designated marksman, but we've already agreed that squad designated marksman shouldn't carry different ammo than everybody else in the general purpose force. But in the soft force, the squad automatic or squad designated marksman can do whatever the fuck he wants. I and mean, that's, that's what soft is all about. So if the TL uh, team sergeant, whoever, uh, task organization wise, if they're okay with, with one homeboy running around with 762, uh, that's way, you're not making a conscious decision to lose an assault guy on a 12 man ODA by saying, oh, homie, you're the sniper. No, that, that's dedicated long gun shit. And, and, and in small teams like an ODA or a SEAL boat team, you don't necessarily have the bodies to, to chop a dude to do that. Uh, so in the soft force, a lightweight rifle that can do CQB and then still have enough glass on top to be able to shoot the dudes that refuse to get into your realm. You know, we talked distances earlier about, yeah, uh, you know, we own 200 and in or everything beyond 300 you can't see and blah, 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 blah. That is all absolutely factual information. And that is why the longest war in U.S. history is being fought by an enemy that has fought us longer than any other enemy. And that enemy will not get within 300 meters of us if they can help it. So we're having to adapt our entire army to fight against an enemy that refuses to get within 300 meters of us. If you can fucking get within 300 meters of a Talatubby, you have done something magical. You have snuck up on that motherfucker because it's like he's got an auto rangefinder. He's like, oh, Americans within 300, I'm out. 
because he knows he is a dead son of a bitch inside of 300 meters. So he will not let you get him by the belt buckle. Uh, and that's why I think we're seeing this, this guy, this, you know, um, dudes that have Iraq time. We're like, like, it, it's like, we're telling nom stories in the Panama time frame. It's really weird. Like, you know, we have all this stuff. Thank God I fought both and I can see it, you know, cause all these other dudes, they're like, Oh the fuck. I got three tours in Iraq. I, you know, stack bodies, fucking Fallujah 2.0, all this stuff. Yeah. That was Iraq, man. And I've been in both. And, uh, it's the same army that was fighting two different fucking wars. And, uh, and Afghanistan is not Iraq and the next place won't be Afghanistan. So we go right back to an urban shithole. I don't know if I want everybody running around with a goddamn musket. You know, that's the, that's the conundrum we find ourselves in right now, gentlemen, third mod cast in a row that we've gone back to this conundrum. So let's move on. To <laughs> hey, Joe, I just wanted to say, uh, um, you know, getting back to you a little bit on the on the on the seven six two with the shorter barrel, um, a lot of the I think the misconception that people think uh, when we go to a shorter barrel is that we lose accuracy inherently because of a shorter barrel. We don't necessarily lose accuracy; we lose velocity. A a properly cut barrel with and and I've proven this myself and sent, well. I've, I've gone this way. I'm really leaning towards it. I have one that, that works real great, but I like a shorter barrel with a tighter twist. I'm running a, a one and eight twist and uh, you're not losing accuracy. You're losing velocity. Um, the repeatability is still there given uh, assuming that the barrel is a quality barrel that would have performed, you know, anyway, from, from a quality barrel maker, but you know, lo losing velocity is not the same as losing accuracy. It's the repeatability is there. It's just, you're you're having to compensate a little bit more at distance. You're having to you know hold over or, or come up on your your elevation a little bit more. But loss of velocity is not the same as loss of accuracy for uh, for the viewers that are watching this and thinking that like you got to have a twenty inch pipe to reach out to somebody at eight hundred. You, you don't. You but don't. one of the things that we didn't hit on because we jumped uh, right over in the history lesson after the last comments about effectiveness of. 7.62 and 5.56 in terms of range and lethality and all these other things. Um, we're not talking about BC because non-snipers don't understand BC. But BC, in, in idiot terms, is your ability to put the crosshairs on a motherfucker and have the bullet follow them crosshairs for as long as possible before you have to start doing sniper shit. Everybody, that, as, a, as a stupid idiot term, that, that's about as, as idiot term as I can get it. It's not sniper accurate, but it's close enough. So. Uh, that's why in the previous modcast, when we talked about non-sniper uh, agencies getting 338s, it was to get the BC to have a hardware problem, a hardware solution to a software problem like Master Gunner said. If I put, it, if I put it, a 338 bolt gun up in this guard tower, any monkey can crosshair center mass punch pretty much everything they could see from this guard tower. Uh, out, out to 600 meters or beyond. How far away is that? I don't know. Put the crosshairs on them. Pow! And so when you start chopping barrels, that's when you start losing your laser beam. And with 7.62, we're not seeing a battle rifle advantage ballistically. Uh, where you're going to see it is in wind. Those light 5.56 rounds, these dudes that can SPR all day, yeah, you're SPRing with 77 grain. You're SPRing with, with, with shit that can that can stand up to the wind um, better. When you start taking lighter cartridges in 5.56 five, and you start winging them out there or you keep chopping the barrels on the 5.56 five, and you get the lesser velocity, wind starts kicking that, that bullet's ass. So on a zero day, I'll take a, I will take a Mark 12 like all day long or something like that, or our SPR, right? I'll take that some bitch all day long. Uh, but out uh, once the wind kicks up, now we got to start looking at what what solves wind problems, and we can't teach Joe to hit the damn E type in zero wind at five and six hundred meters. If we start putting systems in there where wind becomes a greater factor, environmentals become the external ballistics become less than optimal. We're not going to get the bang for our buck, and that's why I hope to God this fucking experiment that the army's doing. Uh, you know, isn't all doom and gloom. Uh, you know, it's like fucking 
opening the gate on fucking gays all over the place. Well, we, we got dick, 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 dick in the military. We haven't all fucking died. So, uh, you know, maybe we let a little bit of that fucking 762 HIV out there and we learn, um, we learn the tactics, techniques, and procedures. This army's got to learn how to fight, how to resupply itself with less bullets. It's going to change tactics. It's going to change logistics. It's going to change. The second, third order effects are going to be huge. While we are trying to find that uber caliber, 260, 65, whatever it is, that's going to give us that true ballistic overmatch that we want, that flatter shooting, better BC cartridge that allows the rifleman to shoot straighter and flatter by just putting the reticle on the bad guy further away. While we are striving to get to that technological solution, we're using the same ammo we already got, and our leaders are unfucking it, and we're doing it in a microcosm. We're, we're, we're fielding this thing one element at a time, and the TTPs that we're going to learn through this are going to be plug and play once Uber Gun shows up. Fingers crossed. I think that's I think that's what's going to happen, um, Chuck, because if, if we've got enough people who are in the know, who can sit there and pay attention and have the longevity, that's going to be the challenging part, though, is making sure that the people are in the right spots who have the longevity to be able to affect the uh, um, movement in the right direction. Like Ash was talking about previously when it came to doctrine, they just happen to have the right people in the right place at the right time to make that happen. And, you know, that's, that's not necessarily within the scope of this discussion, but I think we can make that happen. I think that if we talk between five, five, six and seven, six, two right now, if we look at what the army has in supply versus M80 ball, five, five, six green tip or the new EPR round or whatever, like the, the M80 ball is going to stand up in, <laughs> Yeah, we want the laser beam bullet. We want something that's going to allow first round hits more probable at extended ranges, depending upon whatever fight we're in in the future. And that's where the M80 ball will outperform 5.56 five, just due to it's heavier and it's it's it performs better. You know, not talking BC, even though I am, but that's what we're talking about, is that that, that 762 is going to outperform the 5.56 five, at distance. Because we have four minute of angle 556 five, guns, we got M14s, we got, you know, whatever the new weapon's going to be, um, you know, the Army, I think, is going to have to expend its surplus of ammunition prior to uh, buying some new 77 grain or buying more LR or special ball or even M852 match that still surfaces up every now and then, you know, because that, that's a good round between three and 600. It's a phenomenal round, you know, but it doesn't it doesn't show up that often. So they're not going to stock up LR. It's hard enough for active guys to even get that stuff right now, unless you're downrange. They're only getting a little bits of it here and there. Um, you know, I just did a big ammo request, and I'm getting half of my allotment for train up for international sniper comps. It's going to be special ball because they're running out of LR. <laughs> so. <laughs> You know, which is which is fine. I can still get the train up of stuff, you know, but I'm going to have to, uh, you know, make sure the last half of my lot is going to be all LR because that's what I'm going to compete with, you know. You, you you missed my modcast where I talked about having to sign for all the ammo in place downrange and walking into the a ammo bunker and seeing wooden crates full of SR-25 mags loaded with 118 LR that had been discarded because the battle rifles were too heavy. And now it's like, what lot is that? Don't know. Can't find yeah. a long gunner that'll put it in their gun. You know, it's like, I got free 118 LR. Really? What What lot? I don't know. Man, go fuck yourself. You know, like, your crack's been cut. And it's like, no, yeah. man, it's still crack. You know, it's like, I don't know how pure that shit is. And, you know, the snipers get all the voodoo and shit in them. And, uh, you know, they, they run away from that shit. It's like, I'm surprised you didn't link it up yeah. and use it in your Mark 48 there, uh, Chuck. <laughs> I mean, it's 21. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be a freaking yeah. op that'd be an accurate shooting freaking machine gun. I the have seen, party I have seen, pack, man. <laughs> I've absolutely seen one one eight LR linked and fired in a machine gun. Same here. <laughs> it's it's a sight to see. Yeah. Yeah. But I it think normally I, happens about second week in September. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, the September spendix, you see it all. Yeah. God. Makes baby cheese cry. 
I think it's really cover right now is that we what we've just covered is a is a huge swath of topics. And I don't think a casual viewer is really going to understand exactly how many things just got hit like within about the last five minutes of this conversation. You know, but we went from one and eight to a sixteen inch seven six two guns, um, all the way through like the effect of, of intermediate calibers on on the, the current battlefield. Uh, it, you know, it's 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 really pretty amazing and. Um, I'm, I'm kind of going to skip over a couple of these things, and I, and I, I kind of want to get to like, like what I really consider to be the meat of the conversation, which is that if you're talking about 5.56 five, and 7.62, you're talking about the past. You're, you're gone. You're out of it. And one of the most important things is something you just mentioned about having the right people in the right place at the right time. And not only do you have the right people in the right place at the right time right now, you have the money. And that's really what everything comes down to because I was there through all the conversations about 6.8 SPC and how great all these other things were going to be, and we watched all these things come and go, and nothing ever really happened. Right now, you have a perfect nexus of information, uh, of, of intelligence, and of skill to actually make something different. And the longer we talk about stuff that was in the past, the longer we talk about stuff that never really worked, the longer we don't get to the right solution. And the right solution is a next-gen gun with next-gen ammo, and it is on our doorstep. So talk about Nemo's gas guns. I know they're running a 300. I know they're running a three, you know, maybe I'm, I'm not super smart when it comes to a lot of the civilian stuff that's out there because my focus is military a lot. But if you talk about them, they're running big caliber AR platforms and that's what we want. We want bullets with high BCs that are point and shoot guns out to whatever range that soldier's capable of hitting in his position, you know? But then ammo allotment, you know, is that making me too far in the past? You know what I mean? I'm not just kind of throwing stuff out. No, I mean, I think I think we're talking about kind of like a, a different ends of what the same conversation is. Um, you know, and, and you're coming from, you know, sniper guy, which is important. Um, you know, but if, if you're looking at a, an interim service rifle, something's going to – and really, interim is stupid. Like, like any, why anybody would say like, hey, let's make a program that's not going to exist in five years. You know, like, boy, let's let's spend a bunch of money on this. You know, um, you know, like I'd much rather be talking about where we're going to go and, and how that's going to be uh, an advantage. You know, and it's like let's look at these intermediate calibers that were so close. We were so close back in the day. You know, and, and Ian can probably go on for you know at length on where we should have been and and what it could have been, and instead of where we wound up. And really where everything is pushing back towards right now. You know what I mean? You want to talk about 7 mil Murray. You want to talk about 264 USA. You want to talk about like a rifle to give to dudes to schwack other dudes. That's the stuff you talk about. Whenever we get into the 600 meter and beyond fight, you're, you're really in an area beyond what an, a, a normal dude that carries a gun for a living is going to do. When you said next generation rifle, what were you referring to? Uh, so if you go on the internet, um, it's, it's a www.google.com. Um, you'll like type in NG SAR, N G S A R. Um, so I, I don't mean to be a complete dick, but I've been drinking whiskey for about three hours now. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so, you know, link go to John it's, C. it's actually an opportunity from the army that's come out and saying, Hey, um, we want to replace the saw. And it's really like a way more eye-opening thing when you when you look into it and what really wants to be done. And um, I hear somebody clicking on the keyboard, so that's cool. Um, so the the concept, you know, is is to broaden the capability of a general purpose force. Um, and and the replacement of saw is the first thing. And they're kind of going down the the M27 direction, which is a good idea. Um, you know, from uh, advancement of an individual platform, um, which is really, I think, what the M27 best serves as, as an introduction to where you can deviate and excel, um, even though it changes the paradigm of, of employment. Um, and uh, the, the concept that you can have a uh, intermediate caliber gun um, where you can carry a bunch of ammo at a weight reduction inside the individual cartridges, um, that's cool. I'm ready for my polymer case 264 USA wonder rifle. My laser beam, laser beam bullets. I mean, you can't hit a thing, you know, it's like everybody focused on like the electrolytes, you know, of what's going on. And maybe it's polymer case, maybe it's some other metal, maybe it's something else. Does it doesn't really matter. You know, I mean, the, the real idea is like, let's lighten the, the weight of what a dude's going to carry to carry enough ammo to really be effective in a fight. 
you know, because we can go back and forth about what a 16 inch gun does, uh, what a 14 and a half inch gun does, 762556. You got to be able to walk in with enough ass to win the fight you're walking to, to win the fight that you got into while you're walking to the fight, and the two fights you got while you were leaving. Just to play devil's advocate here, do you think that one. there is an? Do you think there is enough shooting beyond the the point blank range of five five six to justify a larger caliber cartridge for standard infantry? What? Well, sure. the fights the fights that are going on and the fights that we're going to be facing, um, it's going to require a significant step forward in ammunition performance for one reason or another. Um, and my perspective through research, through talking to others, whatever, is that we're pretty much at the plateau with 5.56. There's not much left we can do to it to, to give it that extra bit. So with that, yes, we will have to find a, uh, a larger cartridge to achieve the effects we want. I assume that would be armor penetration more than anything else. Multiple reasons. Okay. You got to keep in mind there's, there's more, and this is mostly for the viewers out there on the, on the, you know, pod, my cast. There's multiple things that they're considering for this round. It's not so much just its terminal performance. Like John brought up before, 762 will fly flatter. And, and Chuck even brought up, you know, 762 and 338 will fly flatter out to distance. The problem we have with 308 right now is if you're using M80 ball, terminal effects are less than M855A1. You know, it's it's that trade-off. Yeah, it's flatter shooting. You're going to be able to hit, but your terminal effects might be off. So what are the, the trade-offs that we're going to have to make to get that round to be the best it can be? And that's that's what the, the argument is right now. You know, yeah, 762 is, is better in some aspects in the wind than 556, but right now, 556 five, ball, if we're doing just side by side comparison of the ball, it's doing a better job performing. It's against mild steel. So where's the where's the trade off there? You know? I mean a big a big part of this is also when you come down to the 762 556 five, comparison, we kind of fall into a really easy is when you look at 762, we're basing a lot of our data off 20 inch barrels. Who wants to lug them out? I mean, like how many of you just said we don't want to carry SAS? Who wants a 20 inch 762 gun? You know, so when we start talking about 16 inch, even better, let's talk about 14 and a half inch guns, you know, and, and the ammo that you're going to need to, to really make that more effective because there's some awesome stuff out there, but it's not 170 grain Sierra Match King. Well, and also along with that, look at what the, the general trend has been towards weapons being suppressed. If you've already got a 20 inch barrel and you throw a suppressor on the end of that freaking barrel, now you're freaking looking like an M14. Yeah, that's right. I said it, Ash. That's twice now. I heard John Brady say it. I'll get him later. Yeah, well, that's that, okay. Jack Lubia said, and he was actually he used to get to describe uh, the 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 makeup, but he used the term blended metal, and I almost had a Lamaze seizure. Like yeah, like I hadn't like I'm like Obi Wan and shit. That is a term I've not heard in a long time. Um, but anyway, I'm I'm recovered now. Thank you. Triggered. Well, that's the thing is, uh, you know, that's maybe, you know, 308 may not be the answer just because of its short build behavior. You know, um, the unfortunate thing is that big stuff, it's it's hard to, you know, you know, you got like 65 Creedmoor, which is fucking sweet in, in that kind of that same 308 envelope. But, but, you know, you're losing your, you know, that's a 22 inch barrel if you're really wanting to do it right not you know not a 16 inch barrel um and yeah the suppressors you know i i think it's it's probably safe um at least it's so safe it's a it'd be a good bet as you know the the requirement writer or the weapons designer perspective to bet on uh those guns being suppressed and design around that um because you know you know it's uh it may not be a hundred percent of the time, but it's going to be a hell of a lot more than it ever was in, in the history of firearms uh, in terms of guys running around with suppressed guns. 
in this day and age, if you're not running out with a suppressor, like just get out your bow and arrow and your torch and just go do it that way. Yes. Why not just use a muzzle loader at least? Uh, but we should also challenge uh, the paradigm of the past. And it, it's probably been a while since we talked suppressors on a modcast, but um, months and months and months ago when I was talking to Kel, I was asking them, you know, why, why? why? Why does the suppressor have to be this big? So in order to get it quieter with a larger caliber, it's got to be longer. And you, it goes back to older requirements about um, height over bore, blocking iron restrictions, doing all these other things. And we need to look at all of that and, and the suppressor guys need to be looking at, from a physics standpoint, gas expansion, best efficiency, whatever, can you give me the same dB reduction out of a fatter, shorter can? And will that fatter, shorter can work with an optic on a riser and potentially a laser with a slight offset? And so if I can maintain a four inch suppressor that does an eight inch 762 cans job, why wouldn't I do that? Uh, unfortunately, the physics are such that I can't just make it twice as fat. I can't take this, cram it inside of this and make it four inches and have it be the same because I ain't a fucking engineer and science is science. But in a perfect world, that's the direction that we should be, we should be looking at like no shit out of the box, question every why have we always done it this way solution from suppressor attachment to uh, overall length, to uh, heat, to dB, all of that needs to be looked at with this new system because I think I think there's a way to, to crack the code. I think that we can get a suppressor that is more efficient than the original SR25 yolk. You know, that, that there's got to be something better out there than that, right? We all know there is now, but there's something better than what we have now if we push the industry to go that direction. Yeah, I mean, you, you bring up a good point, you know, and um, I've got a little bit of experience in that, you know, and like one, suppressors are hard. You, like it's it's hard, like it's like really hard, um, you know, and two, it's it's regulated and, and you know, you got to do all kinds of things with your baffles and what you're doing with it and like how much you can make so you can just go in and test it. Um, you know, I mean, like the amount of paperwork that I have to do to get 10 suppressors in to go put on 10 gun, just 10 nothing the statistical analysis of 10 guns is like nothing like like real statisticians laugh at you when you say that was your data sample um you know that's it's difficult and you know so part of it's because we're stuck in in this this legal loophole of just trying to to be able to to make this thing with the stuff you have let alone start getting into making all kinds of weird new stuff you know and and you know i mean how many of you can raise your hand and say hey man every time i put on a suppressor my accuracy got better uh, most of us can, right? Well, it's because you didn't see the 50 versions that sucked before we ever got to that point. That said, this one worked pretty good first time out. Just saying. Are those balls at the bottom of that? What? No. Got the RMR put on it, though. I'm uh, actively uh, drawing up a set of tall iron sights for it. So, Ash, you've been mostly quiet other than addressing the, the, the evil gun. What are your thoughts so far? Yeah, these, these guys are putting in a lot of good info. Um, I listened on the way back from the uh, little pistol competition tonight, so trying to keep up. Yeah, we, we've hit a lot of this stuff before. The 762 is Mr. Right now. It's not Mr. Right. So whether we end up at 6.5 or we end up with some sort of cool thingy or whatever, um, there's, there's going to be dudes go somewhere at some point, and they're not going to be able to get kills. So that's that's the thing we got to look at. And, you know, we, we can fight the 762 gun all day long. Uh, the guy with the credit card has already got it, and he's already getting ready to swipe it. Um, you know, it is what it is. So th the best thing that we can do is try to get the the best one out there when it comes up for the when they start doing the doing all the. I don't know if they're going to do a competition or however they're going to buy these guns. I don't think they're going to sneak by with the SDM like they did with the or like they did with the SDM. So maybe we just gotta get some guns out, start banging on them. I know we shot some. Uh, 
of the nice gun, the 110Ks, a long time ago. And we ran them through basically an SRM qual. And they did fine for the SRM qual, but the SRM qual is extremely easy. So if you just handed them to those dudes, they'd be like, yeah, this is great. Uh, we just got to make sure that we get a gun like that. I'm not saying we're going for the 110K. Uh, I know Jack would love that. But, <laughs> yeah, you know, something to that effect is where it's an actual, you know, because as soon as you say 762, people go, a sniper gun, like you guys are talking about. We need an assaulter's gun in 762. And that, that, that's going to actually be the, the hardest part is to make sure that we get a gun that does that. So what are some predictions? Obviously, we need to look at something modern, something that's effective. There are some good contenders. What are the, the predictions as to the big where it's going? Right, one of the big things right now is um, I know well, some of the test mules for the 264 USA uh, have been the small frame 308s. Um, and that's at least on paper, that's a that's a, uh, I think a good fit of a gun for that kind of that in between a cartridge that uh, 264 USA and the 270 or whatever version of it is. Um, so something the down that line might be possible. If the military is though going, if we can pretty much say, yeah, they're going 308. What are the what are the well, potential options? Well, then that's and that's what I was getting at is a small yeah. well a small frame three hundred eights, uh, you know, is better is is a good suit for the the post three hundred eight or the current the current leader of the post three hundred eight cartridge, but also plays pretty good um, with a three hundred eight now. You know, that's okay. So they can get those guns in there, and then when they get the, all this, you know polymer case whatever bullshit going on with 264 and a bullet they like for it then you know swap some bolts swap some barrels here's a new magazine let's go to town um not that they would do that but the 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 idea exists and you know that may that may be you know that may be a good bullet point on a powerpoint is what i'm getting at uh the help hey we can do this uh looking forward you know Maximize the the investment right now. Yeah, not that any of that was likely to necessarily come to fruition that way, but no one's ever thought that far ahead. So, Chuck, what are you thinking? Uh, Where do you think we're going? Well, I don't have any, um, you know, insider information uh, anymore. I'm out of the loop. I'm a civilian, but. Uh, you know, I think you're going to see all your usual suspects and then the mom and pops are going to throw in there just like, you know, you had Jim Bob's bathtub gin fucking rifle manufacturing company send a rifle in for SCAR. You know, it's we're going to see it. Uh, GA, GA Precision, they're going to throw a gun in. Fucking Remington's going to have a 762 gas gun in. SIG's absolutely going to play. Uh, you know, obviously Knights uh, is in the lead. Um Mark's going to, Mark is going to, you know, wake up and, and decide that he's going to play with the federal government again, and he, he's going to submit a weapon. Uh, this is all, it's all destined to happen. If they, if they do a, an open market proposal, whatever you want to say, and everybody sends in RFPs, we're going to see, you know, a big shoot off or a not so big shoot off because they're going to open the boxes and be like, oh, mom and pop's gin shop, no 762 blank adapter, you're disqualified. And uh, and you'll see. I mean, that's how that's how the Robinson Arms fucking rifle got thrown out of scar trials. It never even made it out of the fucking box. They opened it up, no blank adapter, shut it, fucking taped it back up, ship ship that shit back to Robinson. Uh, you know they they shipped Glocks in for the Beretta trials. They opened the box, eh, no manual safety to cocking lever. So boxed them back up, sent them back to Glock. So on day one, there'll be some serious butt hurt. But uh, anybody that's going for a contract of this magnitude, if you're not hiring somebody that understands programmatics and is setting up your RFP for you, uh, you're, you're doomed to fail. You can't be a good gun manufacturer and not have a good program guy because uh, you don't know what you don't know. And the Eisenhower Military Industrial Complex is going to roll you the fuck over. So you better bring your A game. Uh, that's just that's that's the way it is. Um, now, <clears throat> once we once we get that down selected rifle, it's not going to perform as uh, it's not going to perform as advertised. 
Stop it. You're not having Mexican tonight. Um, you're, you're gonna, uh, it's, it's gonna have, it's gonna have some growing pains. We're gonna have issues potentially, you know, X, Y, or Z, but it's gonna be hated across the board by the troops once they get it in their hands. And you're gonna have squad leader after squad leader after squad leader for the next three to five years screaming, I would rather shoot that guy twice in his super plate that I can't defeat with my current rifle, knock him off balance, hit him once in the kneecap, and then run over there and shoot him four times in the fucking face, then carry that rifle in the field again. Uh, because we're going to over-engineer it, over-design it, over accoutrement it, and everybody is going to be carrying like something that's as heavy as a fucking Mark 46 uh, or heavier. And, uh, and that's, that's just going to be the reality. There's no, there's no getting around soldiers' load. And soldiers fucking care about the load because they carry it 99% of the time and they shoot it 1% of the time. That's my prediction. Well, and you've, you've inspired me again to think about it. So yeah, let's, 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 yeah, the, let's say an open one. What, what are we going to see? Yeah. We're probably going to see two guns from Knights. If I had to take a guess, um, you know, you're going to see some stripped down G 28 or whatever the fuck the 308 crop magic is. Um, for the listeners, oh. someone just said three or indicated three weapons. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> or six. Now he's saying six. Uh, let's see. Uh, probably two guns from Sig. Uh, some sort of SR twenty five looking thing, and some sort of mutant three o x three o eight MCX. Um, you know, probably a, a variant of two along the same lines as some Scar variant. From FN, maybe something else. Who knows? Um, Will this new yeah. variant be able to to uh, allow uh, optics to survive, or will it still kill them? I don't know. Better as hell have a uh, non reciprocating charging handle. I know that much. Um, uh, so, Jordan, have you heard anything about Glock's three hundred eight carbine? One in the chat was asking about that. You know, people joke about that. If Glock put their mind to it for a fucking carbine, they'd kick everyone's ass. Just imagine that. Like a Glock and 556, what that would... Dishwasher you know, safe. That would be awesome. Yeah, we'd have like $400 ARs that didn't suck completely. I mean, I, I've said this for a long time. Like, I mean, I would love to see GM or Ford or Nissan make small arms. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the things that we are willing to accept... Um, as as a buyer and as a community is completely different than if you compare it to a, a much different community. GM and Ford did make them back in the day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the spew yeah, was to come out to become out from the beginning of okay. Your job is to design a gun that will meet this. You know, they're they're going to hire all the, the the top people in all their fields. are going to hire all the top metallurgists. They're going to get all the ammunition guys. Give put everything on the table. And, you know, to, to their ability to hold tolerances, uh, you know, I mean, I, I've talked to guys that design um, uh, fuel injector pieces that, that hold to tolerances that, I mean, literally, like, made me cringe. <laughs> well, now we're talking space guns, you know. It's like, okay, that's all cards on the table. Let's make some, uh, you know, let's make something that's got the oomph of the 308, weighs four pounds, and doesn't recoil. All right. It's possible. Go. Yeah. Sounds I think what we're going to find out. I think what we're going to find out tomorrow in the news is that Knight just Knights just purchased a uh, automobile manufacturer, and that's why he's going in that direction. Now, I think historically, a lot of those automotive guys are they're kind of off the mark. They tend to do things they don't quite. They don't. There's something to be said uh, about just getting it there's there's some sort of uh kind of tribal knowledge there that uh you just can't throw you can't throw just smart people and resources at and and get a gun at um yeah Jordan, i think we talked about it kind of privately a long time ago and you know and it's, it's one of the things that you know not 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 to, to hug up to my company but you know it's one of the amazing things about knights you know is that mr knight could literally walk away from this today and he does it because he loves it. You know, it's, it's one of those things where you get people that just love this industry and love what they do and love the people they support. 
and that's where we come from. And um, I, I think I think it it drives a really interesting point in you know state of the art. It, it really is it's an art because you, you you know Ford uh, you know Ford's last hurrah in in the whole small arms arena was the saw program and had two uh like the xm uh 248 and like the 243 or whatever were 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 ford guns um and they're fucking weird they didn't make any sense they're like what have you guys ever seen a gun before i you know i appreciate the open open mindedness here but uh you know there's 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 a gap there um for sure um I think some of that's faded, right? You know, because um, actually, a lot of that, at least in at least in the in, in, in the small arms industry, or the the small arms section of the military industrial complex uh, has eroded. Um, I think the you know the M14s and, and M60 or, and M60 programs uh, helped destroy a lot of that, along with this complete failure of of army small arms ordinance, uh, in that same, you know, post world war two, um, because they were, they were the guys driving a lot of that stuff. Um, now it exists still here because I can tell you from a matter of personal experience, um, when shit got real on the manufacturing side of things, um, you know, that second big rush turnaround, you know, 2010, 2012 in there, uh, the OEMs and vendors everyone started leaning on hard were out of work automotive guys or shops and various process vendors and whatnot. Uh, you know, previously it was picking up the aerospace slack, but uh, you know, it, it kind of timed right that, okay, yeah, we're going to start using, uh, there's a lot of automotive OEMs out there that, that capable of doing this work. Um, they're looking, looking for some work. Um, you know, a lot of your, uh, your real cheap ARs that kind of didn't exist uh, more than a few years ago. Um, that's exactly what they're from. They're out of they're from from uh, areas um, where there were big automotive hotbeds, um, and a lot of OEMs. So, okay, we've got these machines and these know how, and and you know, and production numbers down, but from Ford, Nissan, and and Toyota, and everyone in that you know that general that Tennessee, Kentucky Valley area. Uh, where a lot of those cars are made so it's like well, all right well i like guns let's start making guns and that's exactly what a lot of them did jordan i'm a bit disappointed you're not remembering your roots with daewoo and Carnicon. <laughs> yeah well yeah there you go daewoo well you, you're getting into the whole the 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 kind of the asian like mega company right they're they're a lot uh you know you've got like daewoo and like fuji heavy industries and stuff that uh, and Hyundai and, and stuff like that, where they've got a finger in fucking everything. Um, that kind of, that, 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 uh, um, real horizontally integrated manufacturer has kind of died off a little bit in the U S. Um, but it's a, it's still definitely, a, you know, you know, it's definitely a thing there. Like you look at Kawasaki. Yeah. Okay. They make keyboards and motorcycles, but they also make fucking jets, helicopters, tanks, you know, guns, Anything, you know, you know, some Japanese, you know, ministry of whatever needs is like, oh yeah, we can do that. I, I just want to hit something real fast and um, it was kind of brought up and it, it, it kind of got skimmed real, real easy on the amount of responsibility that's laid upon a manufacturer of a single item um, into the, the whole, when it comes to, into procurement. Um, and it's, it's, Pretty readily seen if, if you kind of go through some of the, the solicitations on board. Um, when you look at the requirement of a rifle manufacturer to integrate, a, let's say, ammunition and an optic and a laser and uh, this hard case and some other random thing, um, you know, laid upon a bunch of other stuff. Um, you know, it's like, hey man, like maybe there's a suppressor manufacturer that's really good at being a suppressor manufacturer. And is it really necessary? to make the the one central point of this responsible for all aspects of that. And that's kind of what we're seeing in a lot of recent solicitations and elite recent programs is that like we, we have to do 
all of it and, and we're responsible for all of it. And if one of those things doesn't work out, we're completely out. And you know, so you wind up doing a bunch of like really safe stuff and a bunch of easy things. It's like, well, let's take this. Hey, do you like this thing? Yeah, we'll just use that thing then. Is that the best thing? Uh, well, I don't know because that's not what I make. Yeah. Um, and, well, you see that, you, you see that. Yeah. And a lot of those procurement programs, is you definitely get, uh, uh, you definitely get bonus points for being uh, vertically integrated. Um, that's uh, a lot of times that that definitely helps um, helps get you uh, you know get you moving farther forward uh, or you know puts more points in your column uh, versus the guy who's subbing everything out uh, you know despite the fact that the guy who's vertically integrated may have no fucking clue how to run a CNC machine or heat tree aluminum or something and the guy who's subbing all out the guys who know what they're doing and all they worry about is getting all the shit and putting it together to make sure you know, is just doing the quality, the you know, in quality control and assembly on on something, and build a better thing for cheaper. But you know, the a lot of those requirements are are you know are built so they don't aren't necessarily being rewarded for doing the smart thing versus you know just being vertically uh, integrated all under one roof or something. Even though you you get total shit. Um, You've also got to look at import export. Uh, that's that's huge and it's stuff that we especially during the gwatt we cheated on and we were buying stuff from overseas and uh then then you're you're at the whim of these other people and i mean this is capitalist america the government's not going to come in and seize a factory and force them at gunpoint to produce more x y or z but uh, at least if it's an American company that you can put political pressure and other pressure on the manufacturer to do the bidding of the government when it comes to crunch time. So uh, some, some numbers and don't hold me to them a hundred percent, but uh, uh, the seals were having supply issue problems with the SIG pistol prior to uh, the SIG factory opening up in um, New Hampshire. Uh, it, it, it's been alleged that uh, Beretta said that they were only going to build the first 5,600 M9 pistols in, in Italy and that they were going to build a Beretta USA factory and produce all of the handguns in the United States. Sig Sauer told them that only Uber German DNA could produce their weapon systems and that the entire Army pistol program would be manufactured overseas. And the allegations back in the late 80s were that the acquisition authority of the United States government gave Beretta USA SIG's closed envelope bid so that they could undercut it because what they wanted was that fucking factory in the USA. Um, so there, there's a little there's a little acquisition conspiracy theory for you. Uh, so then we move on. We look at HK416 barrel accountability. We look at customs bonded warehouse importation stuff like me having to cut a separate contract to LMT to make full auto M4A1 lowers to go on my Uber uppers because my Uber lowers are stuck in customs bonded warehouse and I'm, and I got a war to fight. So I'm, I'm downrange in Iraq with a Franken gun made by an American manufacturer and a German manufacturer. The, I mean, these things have all happened. And so when you start talking about outsourcing of parts uh, and, and overseas outsourcing of parts, um, you're, you're leaving yourself open to all these from an, e, uh, an OEM standpoint. And I don't think the industry really understood from an American manufacturing standpoint how stovepiped we are in certain things. And it wasn't until the Sandy Hook gun scare, and we talked about it, uh, when, when you've got the AR lower manufacturers and, and uh, rail cutters that everybody else is just slapping their logo on, when they're maxed out, when you can't even get the aluminum to cut the rails. We had entire companies going out of business because they didn't make their own shit because they were buying somebody else's shit and slapping their name on it. And so was everybody else. And when everybody needed stuff right now at the same time, because there's a gun panic, all the supplies dr uh, dried up. So, okay. Now, finally, finally, solidly in my warehouse um, wheelhouse here. Yes. Uh, this is, this is what I, you know, this is my true calling in life here is, uh, you know, that was one of the big things. Uh, one of my big long-term projects, uh, it took me, a, you know, worked on it for a couple of years at uh, CMMG was uh, 
developing a supply chain outside of the uh, typical everyone else, essentially. Um, you know, there's only, uh, there's some things that couldn't, it wasn't smart to, to do it yourself or do it outside the normal guys. Um, but we did uh, spend a lot of time uh, figuring out ways to, to insulate us from, from that yo-yo and the supply issues um, and how to ride out some of that stuff. Um, now, if specifically ARs, AR-15s, and, and, you know, to stay on topic a little bit, a lot of it, uh, all this, it all ties into to AR-10s too um, because they all, the parts are effectively the same. Um, they may be dimensionally different, but how they're made and where they're made and, and the processes that go into it are all the same. Um, so pretty much the only thing uh, we ended up ever being, you know, getting hamstrung on was uh, lower receiver forgings um, and upper receiver forgings. And and the problem the problem you run into that uh, specifically in the in the U.S. domestic market uh, is the guys who are the cheapest and the best and have the, the most quantity available is all the same person. Uh, everyone else is, is, is worse quality, lower delivery and costs more. Um, so there's, there's like, yeah, I, I don't want to go outside of that, that stream. Right. Um, but you know, on the, everything else is pretty much, uh, you know, open, open for business. There's if, you know, there's a few things that, you know, everyone may not think about, uh, that come to be a real pain in the ass. Um, uh, extractor buffers, those things suck. Um, you know, the little piece of plastic that goes in that extractor spring, um, uh, those, I, there's probably one or two people in the entire country that makes those things. Um, because it's one of those, uh, they're like whatever rubber or whatever, they have to inject them into a mold and vulcanize them. And it takes it's like a 45 minute cycle time instead of this injection mold and squirt out every, you know, every, you know, couple of seconds. Uh, so those things go into like 300 up molds and they, and they do that and squirt that out and everything. It's like, and it's like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll do that for you. Sure. Yeah. The tools, you know, a hundred thousand dollars for, this 10 cent part. It's like, yeah, fuck that. Um, you know, and that's, that, that goes into the, the other, you know, um, one of the, the, probably one of the biggest reasons, um, from a cold war perspective, the M16, uh, was a really good, uh, rifle to have was outside of the forgings. Um, and that can, that's, that's a, a problem that can be easily solved. Um, any fucking machine shop with, uh, that was reasonably equipped could make an M16, uh, and make it well. Um, you know, where, uh, something like an M14, Springfield Armory can make them. Uh, and it took them years, years to get, you know, H and R and everyone, you know, the other guys all sorted out. Um, you know, and, and a lot of the other stuff is was before that was the same way where it took entire government facilities, all centralized to actually crank out something that worked um, where, you know, that's, you know, if you want to talk to the true um, power of, you know, that early Armalite stuff, they are 10 AR-15. Uh, it's the fact that they, they designed a gun that, you know, uh, any machine shop in the country could, could effectively produce. Um and yeah, I mean, it's made us nuke proof. You yeah, scared I mean, a lot of liberals by saying that there, Jordan. So Jordan brings up a pretty interesting point in, in the ease of manufacturing and, and how we can produce that. It's really interesting in that like an a M16 AR15 type platform is, is fairly easy from the manufacturer standpoint. Um, Really, a lot of your time, like when when production comes in, is uh, is in assembly and then how that goes, um, which which uh, all that is is a, is a cool conversation. But I think I, I I think the general idea of this podcast and where we're coming from to bring it back around, and I'm kind of sorry that Ian kind of dropped off from what I saw last, um, and and he kind of brought up a really interesting thing, um, and what he what he said was. Do you really see that many fights coming up where you're going to exceed the effective range of 5.56? And really, 
what the, the, the gist of that, that, that I read into it was, can you predict the next fight? And I think uh, like, man, I wish that guy was on here because I'd really like to hear what you have to say about this is that we are really bad at predicting the next fight. And I think that what we're doing right now with an interim battle rifle is a poor prediction of the next fight. And what I'd really like to see is a accurate prediction of what it's like to shoot human beings between muzzle contact and 800 meters and really talk about that. Well, based on the news right now, it looks like it's all going to be digital with meme wars, but that's another topic. <laughs> You're a dick. I know. I'm all for the weaponized memes. Hey, UAV operators got to freaking get their uh, their medals too, you know. So, hey the, guys, uh, I've got a question that I've been chewing on for a little while. Uh, there were questions over next generation rifles. Somebody posted, and it was discussed the scar of. Let, let's look at gas systems. You know. Uh, the piston system, the, the direct impingement system. Personally, I like the direct impingement. It, you know, it, it brings the reciprocating parts directly in line of bore, where your your gas piston adds weight, and it's not directly in line of bore. So you've got reciprocating weight doing funny things under recoil. Then you've got, you know, your HK style delayed blowback. What do you guys think is going to be the the next generation? operating system will it be di will it be piston will it be operating blowback something oh, new so what do you think long stroke pistons guarantee it hey well, here's things i'd say man here's my question had the m4 and the m16 never existed would we be talking about a internal piston anymore Not anymore because of the compactness. Uh, it's the internal piston inline bolt carrier situation with, you know, your stunner style guns uh, is fucking sweet for making light guns that, you know, are well managed in terms of, you know, they're, they're very kinematically ideal. Um, there's not a lot you can improve in terms of just the raw, like in a vacuum, like whiteboard physics behind it. Um, a Miz is you end up, yeah, you can't fold the stock on one. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. No, I mean, you deal is that I, it, that's, it. Like, me. but that's you, a result of the operating system. That's a result of the fact that they decided the bull carrier should be that long so. well there's 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 some of that that plays into the the operating you know they that's there's some synergy between those um you know you could can you make a uh you know a piston thing that doesn't have the big long um buffer care you know the the buffer and longer carrier and stuff yeah you can um is it going to be a goofy kind of laid out rifle? Yeah, it's going to be a little goofy. Um, you know, it, it can be in, and that's one of those things. It's like, I've, I've, I've tried personally, you know, uh, probably 10 different, uh, different like post AR guns um, at, you know, in terms of some form of ideal realization that I've kind of messed around with and, you know, parts of it has been that, okay, let's keep this piston. Let's keep kind of the center line, uh, spring action, but let's get rid of the buffer tube and kind of cramp it all down. And honestly, I, I think some of that I've been held back by my own preconceptions of, uh, what an assault rifle or, you know, that this sort of type of gun should be like, um, because the thing I run into is, you know, this specific example of making essentially an AR, but without the big ass long buffer system in it, um, is the, you know, the receiver part of it ends up being two and a half inches wide. It's like, well, this is goofy. And it's like, and you know, and then that's enough to kind of, you know, cool the heels there. Um, 
I, and I've I've kind of I've personally kind of come around to the to the idea that the this stupid simple long stroke piston, uh, if if dealt with correctly, isn't actually that big a deal. There's really the down the the design and operational downsides of it aren't aren't that isn't that big a deal. Um, I actually what I've what I've come around to is I dislike the short stroke pistons more than anything. Um, and that's just because of the, the, the parts count and, and complexity in the system, um, that, that ends up with you, you end up slapping a piston or you have an extra spring in there and, you know, you've got all these, you know, multiple rods and cups and, you know, it's like, oh, well, mm. or I could do something with a, you know, a basic long stroke that. You know, my piston essentially is my carrier, and it's all one spring, and it's just that much less shit to break or go wrong. Um, um, yeah, yeah I no, know. I mean, I'm I, kind I, of I off rambling. Know. Yeah, no, no. Design I mean, philosophies there. No, I mean, it's I, I, I personally find it super interesting because, you know, as you go into the evolution of a platform and what you're going to do when you hand this to a dude that has to actually go and use it, um, it changed a lot from a whiteboard AR-15, a, you know, M16 into a AK. You know, I mean, when you when you look at a Kalashnikov system, and I'm I'm not at all a Kalashnikov lover, and I'm, I'm not saying that we should, you know, all jump on board, you know, that idea. Um, but it really comes down to we're we're comparing a single system, which is the the M4, M16 type system against everything else. There's only one thing that actually works off of this this standard stoner designed internal piston concept, direct impingement. You know, like if, if you want to go, you know, caveman simple on the concept. Um, you know, you compare it against all these other things. You know, it's like, man, like, what if the, you know the the AR18 benefited from these 50 years of improvement? You know, and and I think it's a really interesting conversation. Um, you know, whether it's entertaining to anybody who's not a fucking complete gun nerd, I probably really doubt. Um, well, you that's know, why we're here. Yeah, and, and welcome to the podcast. Nice to have you. No, uh, and he has returned also, so he can address your comment about uh, prediction. <laughs> no, what, and, and that's, you know, what we're, I guess this ties in, you know, uh, the thing that kind of rattling, rattling around in my head is, you know, uh, the stick a stunner bolt on an AK carrier and let's go to town. Um, but, but what really, really what comes to my, what sticks at me is, um, I think a lot of that and it, it still permeates every, the entire industry, um, is I, it's this inside out, uh, respect to design and how, you know, the gun, <laughs> how we want to approach the the a gun uh, is this kind of inside out philosophy, and it really needs to be outside in. Um, the the ergonomics and like the individual user interface um, of the gun should be should be the the overriding factor. Is is I, I'm not sure anyone's actually sat down and said, okay, hey, let's let's figure out where you know a pistol grip or some other goofy thing should be, how should this trigger work? How should, where and how should be safeties and, you know, oops, the, you know, the bolt, you know, your bolt actuation and all, all, all these little knobs and bits and, and where you hold the gun, how you hold the gun, uh, figure that shit out first and then, and then get something that, that gets bullets out. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of that kind of ergonomics and and user driven design has just kind of happened, and it's just kind of been kind of an organic. Well, this didn't work, and well, this ended up being better, uh, and and nobody's really sat down and, or at least to my knowledge, just kind of designed that gun outside in. Um, and I, I think there's something to be to be said to there. You know, the army's figuring that out. You know, um, between going hey yeah we need m4s we need collapsible butt stocks and everything you know the xm17 was was catching on to it where okay yeah we need some different frames uh the because not everyone's gonna fit uh, a pistol we've got you know 
five foot nothing, ninety pound chicks running around with pistols, and we've got you know six foot five, three hundred, you know, two hundred and fifty pound dudes with it. You know, it's silly to have one one grip that these guys have to deal with. Um, or like you look at even like the M4, you know, modular weapon system where, okay, well, your vertical grip goes here, even though there's all sorts of other fucking places you can stick that shit. Um, yeah, it's, it's just something that's, that's one of my uh, things I always go back to, you know, and it's something they, they figured out with, you know, Air Force figured out with fighter jets. A long time ago, they tried to make uh, they tried to make uh, the cockpits laid out for the uh, the average pilot, and what they figured out was out of like a hundred pilots, only two people actually fit in the damn cockpit, um, because you know it's like okay, well this is all average and it should be close enough for everything, and it, it's not uh, because you had you know guys that you know, torsos were this far, and you know what you know you would expect their arms to be this long, but they aren't, you know. Uh, and they they figured out the whole idea of that kind of uh, configurability to the user uh, and how important you know yeah granted ergonomics is probably uh, more important when you're upside down pulling ten G's uh, versus walking around with a rifle all day um, but you know it's the same idea is is maybe hell we can get uh, uh, make guys better shooters by making the guns easier to shoot. Um, you know, and I think that's a lot of like what the M4 or the whole M16 uh, family brought to the brought to the plate was it's it's an easier to shoot gun than you know an M14. And I don't know. I, I think that's something someone should go a little farther down that road. Yeah, I mean, you, you hit a couple of cool things there. You know, which is you know one, you know, uh, guns don't recoil; are easier to shoot, which is pretty easy. Um, and Two, that mediocrity does not bring excellence, you know, which is, a, a, you know, once again, one of those things that's easy to kind of bring out, um, you know, and, and Ian just popped up and I, I see him like real big on my screen and, and I brought this up and I, I think it's, I'd, I'd like to hear your historical perspective on this, which is, you know, I believe that we have a really um, poor track record in basing a, uh, any kind of acquisitions based off of the last fight and prediction of the next fight. Um, so I, I kind of be interested to hear kind of your perspective on what 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 firearms programs or small arms programs have directly related to a a fight that either we just came out of or currently engaged in, and what that leads to when we go into our next fight. I think it pretty much always does. I don't know that there's been a procurement program yet that that wasn't based around the last war. Yeah, yeah. I mean, were any of them good? Did any of them do an actual good job? of going from what just happened to what's about to happen? Because we don't know, we never know. We're terrible at it. You know, so how, how what's our track record look like? Uh, well, the, the two rifles the US has done that were really good were the Garand and the M16. Um, and those are actually, the, the, the Garand was a pretty good attempt at not, not just going from the last war. Um, now, it was also a substantial technological change, which most other things have not been, um, in that they were going from a, a manual gun to a semi-auto gun. Um, and then the M16 wasn't really about the last war. It was about recognizing lethality and, and weight and recoil and, and designing a gun to do well with those rather than try and replay the Korean War again. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's kind of, I mean, like those two things, I believe you just kind of highlighted a really interesting aspect is not that we're not successful by identifying something that's not completely positive about what's happening right now with an individual small arm. But what's that next leap forward in independent of that factor? Yes, I agree. Um, it concern. I, <sighs> I feel a little bit like I'm going out on a limb saying it because I don't have the field experience that a lot of the other you, you and the other guys here do, but it seems disconcerting to me that a lot of people would be on board for like a 6.5 millimeter intermediate cartridge. It seems like that's largely based on extended ranges in Afghanistan, and that's something that's unlikely to repeat itself in the next couple of conflicts we end up in. And if you do that, you are sacrificing 
the very low recoil of 5.56, which does a lot of things really well. Uh, it seems to me the M16 in its current guise is a damn good gun. And I'm not sure that optimizing it based on what we're doing this year is a wise move for the future. Okay. So uh, there's a cut, like three different talking points that, that I want to address. Uh, first off, um, the 90th, the 90 percentile with the top five and the, and the low 5% uh, being outside of that and trying to design to that spec. Uh, very much correct that the Air Force kind of had to figure that out early because if you can't physically put them in, in the airplane, then they can't fly. That being said, the Department of Defense specifically addresses all of that in the DOD 5000 uh, Bible. Uh, as an acquisition guy, I had to go to school, a separate school from Acquisition 101 and Combat Developments that was just on what they like to use the politically correct term of human factors engineering, which replaced the previous term, previous term of man print, like a footprint with the, the footprint of a man in, in your in your gadget, with your gadget, how the man interacts with the gadget. Now we have non-gender specific. So we have human factors engineering. Uh, because as of now, I think we still have to require people to identify as human. Um so so there are acquisition guidelines in there when you are getting into your programmatics about how you talk about and address the system attributes as they pertain to uh, industry. We want you to make this widget and it needs to be able to work on this many people. And these are the metrics that we're going to use. All of that is, is check the block stuff that has to happen during your requirement and then the subsequent RFP. Uh, so probably not a uh, probably not a coincidence that the modular frame gun was very very well sought after by the government for that purpose. All right, moving on. Um, fighting the last war versus going to the next war. We had a period, well, all the periods up until now, where the country was not in a continuous state of conflict, but we were. And that was the Russians. And so we knew who our enemy was and we knew we were where we were going to fight it. So we didn't have to. Well, who knows about fighting? Well, let's go back and think about everybody that fucking survived the Marne. Nah, fuck that. We're fighting in the fold of gap and we're fighting against the fucking 799th motorized fucking guards rifle regiment. Uh, and, and they're going to be in fucking BMP Gen 1s. And we currently assess their fucking motor pool is only at about 70% efficiency due to fucking satellite imagery of their broken sprockets and dudes in fucking goddamn long johns. It doesn't get any fucking more precise than that. So all of our big army procurement, not brush fire wars, uh, Dom Rep 65, fucking Vietnam, Grenada, Panama, taking the brush wars and putting them aside, all of our acquisition was directly tied into fighting a very specific near peer in a very specific battle space. Uh, then the world, then, then we, then we won and the world became a very unpredictable place ever since then. And we don't know what the fuck's going to happen next. So that quadrian, quadriannual, quadriannual defense review, the QDR, is the basis document that says this is what we expect the Department of Defense to be able to perform in support of our country and its objectives. And, the, and that QDR lays out the requirements. This is Navy. This is what you must be able to do. Marines, this is what you must be able to do. When the Marines go to the fucking Department of the Navy and say, you must replace our LCACs, they're pointing at a specific line number on some fucking requirement deal that says task marines conduct amphibious assault if that fucking thing ain't on that line item they ain't getting another lcac it's going the way of the fucking dodo so it is the mission of the service that drives the requirement for replacement how that requirement is fulfilled or how the military thinks it's going to fight to get to those requirements right now the marines are going off of 50, 75-year-old uh, 
tactics, techniques, and procedures using amphibious and landing craft to put ground forces that will disembark on a beach that they fucking embarked upon from a, uh, a larger ship. So all of their gear, the, the AAVs and the amphibious capability, the LAVs, all of that is all fed into that's the way that you got to fucking crack that code. If motherfucking underwater submarines was the way to go, then we would never see an LCAC. And so if the Marines figured out that from a low visibility, reduced signature, whatever, that taking an LCAC, putting a roof over it, and then sinking it to the bottom and have it drive on the bottom in tracks and come up out of the fucking surf zone and shit, guns blazing, if that was the way to take a fucking beach, then all of a sudden our LCACs look like under a fucking underwater, like giant ass construction vehicles. All right. So, uh, that, that's, that's just, that's how acquisition works. And it doesn't take into account the fucking, the minutia, all the minutia that floats around in there. That's all service specific latitude. Nowhere in DOD 5,000 does it tell the chief of staff in the army you must be able to defeat near peer body armor at X amount of meters or penetrate fucking earthen uh, fighting positions of the North Koreans uh, at fucking 450 yards or whatever. Nowhere is it in there. It says must be able to kick North Korea's ass. Must be able to kick the Russians ass. Must be able to kick the Chinese ass. So from there, they got to trickle down and figure out, well, how do I kick a Russian's ass? I got to be able to shoot the motherfucker. And so, all of our tanks, all of our tank rounds, all, all of that bullshit is now being applied to military small arms. We're playing the decisive overmatch game based upon intelligence received. I, told, I talked about it in a previous podcast. We have military intelligence agencies whose only job is to steal threat equipment so that we can figure out how to defeat that threat equipment. That's pretty fucking baller. There's some some fucking James Bond Cold War motherfuckers that will never know their name, but did some really, really awesome shit. Uh, you know, you guys remember that Iranian fucking uh, 200 mile an hour fucking torpedo that was in the news like a year ago or whatever? The Russians had that bitch back in like 19 fucking 79 or something. And sure enough, somebody gave somebody enough rubles that one of them bitches fell off the back of the truck and it ended up in America. Some bubble on the front to increase the BC of a fucking torpedo Torpedo ended up in America. And we looked at it and we're like, man, this thing's a bunch of bullshit. It doesn't work worth a fuck. So we quit worrying about it. But that's how, that's how these fucking requirements come up. And it sucks that everybody in the fucking army is going to suffer because somebody has found a requirement. Somebody's found a threat that slightly exceeds our current capability. And, well, and we dude, I mean, honestly, like the, they found a threat they don't understand. You know, I mean, it's like, like, let's talk about ballistic overmatch. You know, like, you, you know, these guys are going to come out and say, like, well, we're, we're overmatched by a PKM. Like, yeah, dude, you got some machine guns, right? I mean, do we have to ballistically overmatch everything we encounter? Like, do I, do I get my, like, anti T-72 friggin' attachments, like, next? Or, you know, like, well, how about the anti-hind uh, gun that I'm going to now put into my squad? Much like the arms room concept, I also worked with the gym locker concept. I had body armor that would defeat PK. I had body armor that would not defeat PK. And I had to look at any given night, how much physical exertion I was going to put out, how far I was going to travel, what the mission asked of me, and then what was the probability that I was going to run into a PK on that night. And then I chose whether I fucking weighted myself down with that additional capability. That's not how the army works. If you fucking give them a, a, a new capability, they're going to employ that new capability. With the exception, we already talked about the XAPI program. So maybe me talking about my body armor was a bad example because the army did throttle back from fucking lashing everybody with fucking goddamn tank armor on their front and back right now. But the tank armor's there. They just haven't, they just haven't made you put it on yet. Um, and I just wish to God that this, these weapons or this load or this whatever could be employed in a similar fashion where, where leadership and planning and whatever could take over and we could decide when that's the right tool for that task and then employ, employ that tool. 
Uh, but I don't think we will. I think we're going to get it and go. F- we're just going to go fucking full retard, man. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we've come to the even worse part. It's like not only are you trying to figure out when I'm going to encounter uh, a, a PK that I need to armor against, I need to figure out when that dude needs to figure out when he figured out that I've got a gun that can defeat his armor, that I need to take this other gun to defeat that armor, and next thing you know, you know, it's just it's ridiculousity. Yes. Well, you know, on the on the flip side of the, uh, I guess of a greater like that kind of arms room concept of being like having the tool at hand for anything right and to be able to just this is this solves this this is the hammer for this particular nail um uh is and this is I, something i think there may be some rumblings of but actually being able to get leaner and faster uh in in that development and procurement of new shit right it's kind of one of those things it's like just okay we're going to give up the pretense that we're ever going to have any fucking clue what we're going to be getting into and what we actually need so it's again let's 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 concentrate on on trying to be able to to develop new solutions faster uh as problems you know as new problems uh arise uh because that's you know that's the thing is you know what the fuck are we going to do if some aliens show up start shooting lasers at us you know uh, I don't know. We better figure that shit out quick, or we're gonna, you know, or we're gonna have a right. problem. We accomplished the Manhattan Project, and, and uh, you know, one of my biggest gripes about the the GWAT is, you know, that that meme that came out, you know, ten years ago, whatever, said, uh, you know, America is not fighting a war. The Army and the United States Marine Corps are fighting a war. America is at the mall. Uh, that that is a that is a fucking true statement, and. You know, I, I never saw L3 get ordered into fucking uh, three shift production. No, nobody. I never saw government fucking guards protecting the, the, the two existing draw towers in our fucking country. And like people coming in and checking out and like three eight hour shifts nonstop cranking out night vision tubes. I never saw it happen. I never saw fucking blackouts. I never saw Twix fucking shortages so that we could get more fucking chow to replace the charms and the marines mres i never saw any of that never happened shit didn't happen you know um and so we don't know what we can do collectively i know that our industrial base is gone so i i think that there's this this uh assumption in the american people that we could recreate world war ii if tomorrow north korea china uh fucking india uh, and russia all ganged up against throw pakistan in there uh, they've all had enough, and fucking, they're all they're all against us, and uh, throw the EU at us too. So it's it's us, the UK, and the Jews against everybody. Um, we don't have the ability to to ramp up to a wartime production. There is no wartime production. There's no industry here. Uh, There's industry. It's just different. It's it, it can it cannot be it cannot be ramped up. Rosie the Riveter cannot make an F-16 Falcon. Uh, within the next 90 days. It's impossible. It's fucking yeah, impossible. let's get to that. So, uh, you know, and like I said, we only have two draw towers in the entire country that I know of. Uh, if both of those draw towers were destroyed, we have no night vision production in the entire country for the foreseeable future. Now, I believe something like building a new draw tower, some shit that could happen real, real quickly. That That's where you see, like, the government showing up at construction yards and, like, you guys, you now have a fucking, uh, you know, IDIQ to fucking rebuild L3's entire fucking plant. Here's the fucking thing. That is something you can do with three shifts. You can rebuild a fucking factory that's been blown up with a fucking rider truck. But you can't, um, you can't get the engineers and some of the finer pieces to, like, work motherboards and do some of these other, you know, electronic deals. This, you know... Singer sewing machines can't make nods. Singer sewing machines could fucking crank out a goddamn Tommy gun. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that's a really good point of you know where our technological kind of gap lies um, with the warfighter. Honestly, like, hey, dude, I, I hate to tell you, but your M4 with some R262 mod one will do work. Like that will do work. 
um, give that same dude a, a decent uh, laser and give him a decent set of panos, look, that dude can do work at night like he can at day, which very few people in the world can do. Um, I think that ties in really heavy to Ash, uh, you know, sitting there about the, the training aspect. You're like, what's it take to train a, a general purpose force to really be good with this stuff that the government can afford to give them? And that, that's what we're trying to work on. Let, let's just talk about standards for a second. So the standard for the Army is a four centimeter shot group. I just read an article today. Um, Freddie Blish put it up. He was talking about the Marine Corps. And they, they had this cool one. He's just saying with, with 5.56 five, and iron sights, that the Marine Corps, because they're doing a four-minute standard, we're doing a six-and-a-half-minute standard, that they have better external ballistics, basically, and their iron sights work better. And, well, yeah, because we have a zero that I think Mike and I worked it out. It's in between like 295 and 425 on a, on a six and a half, six and a half minute group, something like that. So what we got to do is we got to start with standards. Number one, we got to start quantifying dudes groups more. We do it at 25 meters and we say, hey, this guy's good to go. And then he can shoot the qual and pass the qual shooting a, I think we figured it out. It was a 13 MOA group total. If he can shoot within 13 minutes, he can qualify. So now we got to look at those standards. And I could hand him an Uber space gun, but if all I'm holding the, the guy to do is a freaking 13 minute group, then shooting out to 600 is not going to happen. I don't care what you give him, unless it's point and click with no recoil and it does all your aiming for you and gets into the cool super gadgetry. And then the guy will probably still miss because he doesn't care. Um, so that's what we've been poking at um, more recently. Um, just got with the a couple of weeks ago, got with the infantry school, Sergeant Major. They're poking at um, figuring out ways to get people down to a four minute group at 25. We're looking at all sorts of things. Everybody's like, I want more KD. I want more KD. And that's what we hear all the time. KD is great. But a KD range costs, the, the number they threw out is $11 million. So for $11 million, I could outfit the entire eastern seaboard of Army bases with marathon targets, and I can put paper on marathon targets. I can do LOMA. I can do this cool thing at, at the Talladega CMP where it tells me where my bullet is down to the half a millimeter every time that I shoot. I can do a bunch of things for $11 million, and, but we need to start integrating something into that effect. And I personally have heard all the stories. I've heard everybody spiel. Frankly, I don't care what it is. We got to start holding guys to standards because if, if you don't increase standards, then we're going to give them this gun and they're not going to be able to shoot out of 600. And, you know, it's kind of like the modular handgun when they made it non-modular with a screw. <clears throat> I didn't give you anything to make your, uh, your overmatch better at rank. Um, but the, going back to a little bit to, the, to what we're doing, the party line is near pier and mega cities. So the, the main focus isn't 600 now. That's a cool factor. Everything we talk about, as soon as, uh, as soon as everybody was kind of like, yeah, we kind of got these wars won a couple of years ago, then miraculously, I don't know where they came from, but the Russians came sneaking out from behind. Once, once we ran out of, ran out of as, as Chuck called them, tally, tally tubbies, as soon as we ran out of them to shoot, we stopped making money off of them. Then all of a sudden, the Russians are back. It was like they've just been sitting around for the past 16 years waiting. Um, so now, now it's Russians. It's, it's near peer, and that, that's what everything that they're focusing on. Not necessarily going back to pull the gap, um, but you think about it. Take Sutter City, and everybody's heard of Sutter City. Take Sutter City and put near peer in that. Put guys with optics, put guys with lasers, put guys in nods in Sauter City today. And I mean, you know, you, you think about it and for a second there, you're like, yeah, we can kick their ass. And then you're like, well, you know, maybe, maybe things are gonna get a little awkward. So that's what they're looking at is all these systems that we have, of how those systems go into play in that mega city near pier. I mean, that's you get uh, what's that? 
All right, since nobody's talking, I'm just talking. That, no, we have missed out on what is in your peer for so long. Um, it, it's, it's almost indecipherable at this point. We, we don't even know what near peer looks like on a battlefield that we barely dominated with people that are like seriously a generation away from like throwing rocks at you from a bucket. Well, then you get to what uh, Fold the Gap was, which is the infantry isn't really all that much more than, as, as one author put it, as a tripwire for use of nuclear weapons. If the enemy makes a serious threat on your infantry, well, you nuke them. You don't rely on the infantry to defeat their infantry. And that, sadly, that's that's kind of the way, kind of the way we look at it. Uh, we'll we'll just pick on uh, every year. We do the Maneuver Warfighter Conference, and it's kind of like a mini shot show type deal. Everybody can we usually have vendors and people show up and. People come in from all of the Army Maneuver Center to the Maneuver Center, and we're supposed to talk about maneuver things, right? It's the infantry yeah. conference. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's the infantry conference. His yeah. mama named him Cassius. I'm naming him Cassius. <laughs> and then, and then, so, so the first year that I was here a couple of years ago, it was all infantry-centric, fighting, fighting Taliban, fighting in Iraq, small arms, lasers everybody had their laser here everybody had kid here um dudes were down there trying to sell their jumpable platforms i mean it was pretty cool there's stuff everywhere and all the meetings were open to pretty much everybody i mean there, there was a couple secret squirrel general meetings that were up that we didn't get invited to you could go sit in on all the stuff oh they put it on youtube you can watch all of the 2015 <clears throat> um warfighter conference on YouTube, it's all there. Last year, it was like invite only, all sorts of stuff. The Ukrainians were there. There was like three gun dudes there. I mean, B Myers was there, and like HK, because they were showing off their little CSAS thingy, and that that was pretty much it. Um, so you just look at it, and that's that's where the entire focus is going. Um, that's that's like the chief driving that stuff, and. Yeah, that the for the infantry dudes, they're you know they're just like, yeah, hey, you got what you got, and it's gonna work. And then all of a sudden, this new threat came out, and it became a became an issue. And they're not even it's not even really a threat. I mean, it's it's just awkward when you shoot somebody and they don't die. So, I mean, there's a bunch of things on that. So, the uh, that's what they kind of focus with with the infantry, but the the tankers and all that sort of stuff is where the focus is at. They're they're looking at this, but they realize in a mega city that the tanks aren't going to do any good because the tanks can't elevate that high. Because when we talk about mega city, we talk about you know Eastern European cities. They're not the not the two story little mud huts that we've been thinking about with towns. You know, you get in there and you got even in Sodor we had five and six story buildings. The tanks couldn't elevate that high. So now I have to have infantry to go in and clear that and do all those sort of things. And so that, that's where it gets, you, know, you just can't throw it out there, just pull the gap, I'm going to nuke them, because there's still 2.5 million people in this city, and 5% of them are bad guys. Yeah, but when you know that you're going to get into that type of um, grinder that's going to eat men, weapons, and equipment, you are going to take measures. I mean, the Marines burned Fallujah burned not burned Fallujah uh, they did that too but uh, and told everybody to get the fuck out for weeks McMaster did the same fucking shit at Talafar problem with McMaster's plan was he left the fucking east side open and flushed all of his moosh into fucking western Mosul and made it the striker brigade's problem but you know hey he became super uber guy of the universe for it uh, if we go into a mega city we are going to be dropping buildings. We're going to reintroduce flame weapons. We are going to, you know, like scariest environment imaginable. Nobody. And we better. Yeah. No, no I mean, 2.0, 2 Fallujah 2.0 was some seriously kinetic shit. And some, some pretty heavy lessons were learned there 
uh, the Army probably being a little bit more heavy-handed than the Marines. The Marines, uh, from what I heard, uh, looked a lot like Full Metal Jacket and that they would clear buildings for a specific to a specific phase line and then drive the tanks up. And then they would clear to a specific phase line and drive the tanks up. And the Army was, I think, a lot tighter with their M1s in that restrictive terrain. Uh, and so the first round that cracked off, they were like, that building. And there was a tank that was ready to to slew and queue on, on that as opposed to having to call the big heavy forward and potentially lose bodies while waiting for that tank to show up and resolve that situation. And, and a rifle squad of Marines with fucking propane tanks with fucking modified explosives on the side, uh, dropping them in fucking murder holes on the roof that they blew with shape charges. That, that's not how you take out a house fucking multiple main gun rounds are how you take out a fucking house. And, and so, uh, I don't think we forgot Fallujah. I know I have it. And so the next big one we get into, we're going to give like the media disclaimer. Hey, we told all the women and children to live, uh, to leave. And then we started dropping the fucking thermal barracks and fucking dropping buildings. And it's going to be, a shit show like nobody, nobody's, you know, in, in the recent media era has ever seen before. But anytime I talk about collateral damage, I just throw Dresden out there. You know, what would Dresden have looked like if they were CNN? Shit was effective me, as fuck. Or just go it's full effective. Starship Troopers and it's flamethrower in one hand or grenade launcher in the other and just start, you know. Well, in, if, in we're, if we're fighting a near peer enemy, they'd better be spending more money on on digital warfare than on small arms because it's going to be more important. Yeah, it's no, dude, really important. That, that's, that's exactly perfect. There, there is not a single sentence that's been uttered in about the past, what, 20 minutes that has evolved around 556 or 762 and our ability to defeat a near peer. Me more. Yeah, me more. That's, that's how we win, clearly. But I, I will tell you that the, the words mega city immediately fucking gets rid of the battle rifle so so if that's the threat we have now you've now created the environmental conditions by which a 762 or uber flat shooting caliber with great lethality penetration and bc are fucking totally null and void uh i again soldiers load, 1890s. you know yeah soldiers <laughs> load fucking going up 60 flights of fucking stairs in full kit like a 9-11 fucking fireman because there's some asshole throwing RKG-3s down on your fucking Bradleys, that's going to suck. It's going to suck at what, fucking at which, bad. Point, at which point you also ran out of rounds after that first three dudes you wound up on that 38 fucking level ascent. And now we're back to designing the uh, G-11. <laughs> yeah, I mean, guns aren't easy. I mean, like, shit's heavy. Well, I, I know we talked about it a little bit a couple weeks ago, but, you know, that uh, that uh, bigger than the, you know, uh, the bigger than the 5.7 the or the, you know, the 4.6, but smaller than the 5.56, five, five, there's, there's something there. There's, that's, you know, that's, if you really, if you're going to be, you, if it's door to door and house to house, and that's the way it's going to be, you know, five, five, six, let's face it, that's way overkill. I mean, maybe. I have to say, it really strikes me that we seem to have, have found a pretty darn good compromise, and general purpose can pretty much do mostly everything with the M16 and the five, five, six. Well, I think that's why it hasn't been replaced yet. Why the M the M sixteen family and five five six, you know, is you know is going on sixty years now, uh, because it it's if there's a jack of all trades in terms of uh, cartridge out there, five five six probably it. Uh, I mean, if you're gonna, if you're gonna put it in a, in a platform that's actually easy to carry and easy to employ, it it does a lot. I mean, it really does. I mean, you've got to get something that's kind of like repping and repeat and recoil characteristics, amount of rounds carried, and the overall size of your platform. I mean, it's like, hey, like, how many of us have wasted dudes with 5.56 five, and 7.62? Yeah, right? Like, how many of us have seen a really huge dramatic difference between the two? 
Okay. So when we stuff those projectiles at a fairly decent velocity inside the stuff that makes people die, it works. So it's getting that projectile to that place where it needs to go. Which, which again, I think the, the Army had that. They, they knew this in the 60s and 70s uh, with the, uh, yeah, all your, you know, all your fletchets and micro bullets and 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 stuff that uh, that yeah you know bullets and people is what kills people not you know not you know super cartridges misses kill very few people true so they did the uh, the great SDM whack a mole is what I called it. Um, Mike and I spent probably most of 2015 fighting the SDM fight. We had, you know, people were wanting a SDM gun. So we've got all these 5.56 options. We've got 77 grand. We got a 5.5A1 that is, that may not be the most accurate bullet, but it's screaming. You know, you, you put that out of 16 inch barrel and it's, you know, probably hitting 3,100 feet per second. So you're getting 20 inch muzzle velocities out of it. You got Jim Hodge building his, his space magic guns. And so we had a lot of good traction on SDM being a 5.56 because we had the bullets to do it that everybody just bought. And we had accuracy and we had range and we had all that sort of stuff. And then somebody decided we were going to go 7.62. And like we, it was like every day we called it whack a mole because every day somebody was coming up with 7.62 and we were dumping all this data on them and it was going great. And then all of a sudden, boom, SDM becomes a 7.62 gun. And the, my, my words are acceptable here, but not appropriate for television, what I was saying in Building 70 to those poor guys, because I had some choice words for it. And the, the effect that we get, just like Jack said, the effect that we get, I've shot, seen dude shot with 7.62 that didn't do anything, and then somebody shot him with a 5.56 and the guy fell over dead. Seen it the opposite way. Shot a guy with 5.56 and saw it, or my gunner laughed because the guy wasn't falling down. So he shot him with the 240 Bravo about four times. Dude, he was, you know, he was done at that point. It just depends on the guy, the bullet, the angle, the rotation of the earth, the, the, how much, you know, the, the lunar eclipse and all that sort of shit and what works and what doesn't. So that to me tells me that it's the same basic shit. There's some cool longer range stuff that we get out of 7.62. There's some stuff that we lose in 5.56. There's gains, there's pluses and minuses across the board. Um, there is a dude, I can't say who it is, but he's very high up in my building. Uh, and everything is blue around him that is adamantly against a 7.62 gun for the infantry. Problem is, the dudes above that guy are all for a 7.62 gun for the infantry based on this near peer threat that Chuck was talking about. And if they have a maneuver background, their entire world, every, every piece of ordinance, every vehicle, every everything that has ever been procured for them since before they were even the military was near peer based. So near peer based acquisition is all they know. Uh, it's all they know. Um, so, uh, if you could find a, say you find, let's say you could find like a bold cavalry officer, like McMaster back when he was a fucking captain or something, and you got him into a gunfight where he ran out of 40 rounds in his Abrams tank, and he was just calling out fucking dudes, uh, heat signatures for his, his wingman to fucking finish up because he was motherfucking Winchester fucking whatever, and then you told him that. He was going to go into a conflict where a 75 millimeter gun is going to defeat everything on that battlefield and he could carry 120 75 millimeter rounds in his fucking m1 you might have had a convert when he was a captain but he never lived through that he was big boar fucking punching everything what are you the rdm you get some hot sauce what are you motherfucking pickup truck you get some fucking hot sauce He's getting everybody the fucking hot sauce. And uh, he ain't got to carry the shit. So, and then, he, and then he's all grown up now. He, he is a general and he knows some shit. 
and uh, the, the guys never had to like take this fucking sabo around and put an ammo pouch and like close the flap on that motherfucker. He's never had to do it. I'm not hating on the guy. He's a he is a uh, he's exactly what the military made him. He did everything the army asked of him his entire career, and he excelled at it. And so he is a victim of his experience. And we're asking him to adjudicate on a subject that he is not truly an SME at. And a good leader, because not every good, not every leader is going to be an SME about shit that they have to do decision briefs on. That's why they have entire staffs that do course of action development, and you got to sit through a fucking decision brief. It's fucking Army PowerPoint 101. The good leader is the one that actually listens to the fucking brief and leaves their preconceived notions of whatever at the fucking door and listens to what the staff has to say and then makes a good uh, factual-based uh, decision based on the data that he has available, not his own opinions about shit. But those leaders are few and far between these days in our service, unfortunately. You know, if we could get back to caveat to Ash's SDM whackable whack-a-mole discussion, uh, the 762 gun for SDM. Uh, two years ago, we were going round and round on this, and I think we shared an opinion. I was actually, and still am, adamantly against the SDM for the infantry. Reason is, we're going to take Joe PFC and teach him how to put precision fires on target out to 600 meters. But his fire team leader doesn't understand ballistics to to give him his sustainment training to kill people at 600 meters. Oh, by the way, he's got a special gun. He's got a special optic. And he now with the interim rifle, he's going to have the same round. Why don't we train everyone to be 600 meter capable? and utilize the assets they've been given and then if anything give them a finishing course in field craft you know build an urban hide use a little bit of loophole theory things like that dude i mean i i think you hit on a really interesting point and the fact that like when it really super duper comes down to it like 600 meter shooting is hard you know i mean like everybody kind of like you know, kind of looks at it and bubbles head up and down, but like actually shooting real things that don't want to get shot at 600, finding stuff at 600 that doesn't want to get shot is really hard. Um, you know, and it, it's, it's outside of the close combat capability of what you expect out of an infantry when it comes to locate, close, with destroy, and seize terrain. Um, there, there's a discrepancy between people that are enthusiasts and like I've got to admit, like I I really like seven six two, really like it, really really super duper. I'm like super duper seven six two guy, you know, like like for no like really discernible logical reason other than like I like shooting stuff with it, I like seeing it hit, I like the the energicity of the platform, and I'm gonna make up new words just to show how much I really like it, um, and everybody. It's, it's really easy for people that, that aren't savvy in what it takes to make that thing work, wants to suddenly give it to everybody because they like it, because they like to do it, because, because they're an enthusiast about it. It's just hard. It's just really hard. And, and especially when you compare, and, and it's come up a couple of times, like your, your ballistics, your ballistic coefficient, you know, like what this bullet does long range. When you start cutting this gun down to what somebody can reasonably carry with a bunch of other ammunition to get all the fights you have to get into, it's unless you have a really highly trained, specialized individual that is not in your general purpose force, it's not to do to carry that gun, man. But that specialized individual, as it stands right now, is a PFC and E3 in the rifle squad. Yeah. That, that's what we're dealing with. Yeah. Because because that dude's a sniper. Because that dude is the equivalent of all these highly trained snipers. That have difficulty with 20 and 7.62 gun shooting on one way LR, which blows, by the way. There's a whole reason why AB39 exists. Um, and and all of a sudden, this dude is gonna kind of master that battlefield and change the course of action of his squad without having any kind of ammunition interchangeability. 
man, like I like the gun, but I'm not willing to put people's lives at risk because of it. Boom. And yeah, to, to answer a couple of comments on the on the live chat, people talking about six hundred is outside the infantry fight. Yes, but that is that's what's being asked is to make these guys reach out to six hundred. The DM's role, even though the DM has never had a doctrinal role except for the striker brigade, but it was never fully defined even then. The DM's role has been six hundred meters. That's where my example came from. So this is the, uh, just, to, just to fire up, this is the slide that we sent upstairs, and it's kind of, uh, I'm getting blocked out right now. So it's not showing up everywhere. But this is a slide. So basically you got your four centimeter one here. You got your four minute one. Then you got going out to 600. So when you tell dudes, hey, you need to group at zeroing, in a three-quarter inch circle and they've been doing an inch and a half circle for their entire career and you say hey this is what you need to do to shoot up 600 people start freaking out trust me and that's what we're just trying to get that's just at 25 meters hey man if you want to shoot up 600 you got to do this and <clears throat> guys are uh guys are freaking out about it there this can't be done it's impossible you're not going to get your guns don't shoot that you're just like well okay well here's a gun that does shoot it but it's still impossible but what, so you're going to spend millions of dollars on trying to shoot at 600 when you can't even do that size of, of just just a grouping exercise that's not even talking external ballistics that's just at 25 yards i need you to shoot really small dude but it's different when you're shooting a range really you can't do it here you're not going to be able to do it there you might get lucky but and that's like but going back to standards that that's where it starts at and are all people going to get there we can't even get everybody firing an inch and a half group right now <clears throat> and i know that i know the marines are better than us and they get everybody to fire out to 500 meters and everybody shoots that far and everybody's a rifleman and i got it i need to put more crayons in my diet and we'll all get there <laughs> but because we know that's all proper but the we're just saying that just i'm going to buy a new gun what's going to happen with this interim gun if guys get a hold of it this is my prediction on the interim gun if it goes to arms rooms then what's going to happen is it's going to sit in the corner they're going to strip all the good stuff off of it anything that's usable the cool optic that comes on it all that sort of stuff is all going to be on to be squad leaders gun and on tommy Timmy squad leaders gun is going to be badass <clears throat> and the other crap's going to be sitting in the corner and it's never going to get used. And then somebody's going to come around, they're going to be like, why aren't we using the 762 guns? And then they're going to dust these things off. They're going to squirt them down with CLP, <clears throat> put all the optics back on them, and miss a whole bunch of stuff. And you'll be like, ooh, never do that again. Put the shit away. And then it's all going to go back. We're all going to be happy. Especially if Knights wins. We're all going to be happy and collectively $100 million lighter in our wallets. I mean, I mean, just from a logistics standpoint, you know, let's look at that squad there. Let's look at that that platoon sergeant. Look at that, you know, uh, company gunny. He's got to figure out how he's going to feed the people that that need to be supplied in a near peer war. You know, I mean, we we've seen the logistics train that it takes to fight people that that haven't reached light bulb stage yet. I mean, like we're still fighting people that don't have shoes. You know, I mean, like let's really think about this, and and. We, we are strained logistically where all of a sudden now it's like, man, we need to plan for people getting shot. You know, like this is, this has been a, a recent development in, inside of non soft actions. You know, I mean, really like seriously thought about considered in all of our planning sessions, like seriously considered that you're going to run out of bullets and I need to get you more bullets at some point to sustain your fight. When all of a sudden you've got, one dude, two, three dudes per squad that has a, a non-standard ammunition that has an ammunition outside of your normal supply chain. You know, like that's another logistic bird. That's another thing that makes it slower for you to fight your guys out of a really bad place. Yeah, but in, in the next near peer war, uh, 
you know, if we're looking at, at mega cities against near peer, uh, Blitzkrieg and uh, the, the soft template that has, you know, been the gold standard since Rumsfeld took over, it's going to go out the window. We didn't do it in Fallujah. The Russians didn't do it in Grozny. They're not doing it in Syria right now. And so as soon as you start fighting a linear war, as soon as you start pushing by phase line, you're turning over every rock. Uh, you're arresting, or killing, or causing the fleeing of every military age male. So all of a sudden, your logistics trains, they widen right the fuck up. We had this conversation a couple of podcasts ago about how did we sustain an army in World War II with that light-ass day pack that was held up for all of us to see. Thank you. Uh, the, um, the way we did that is cause cookie and a fucking Willis Jeep was going to show up with a fucking mermite every night and nobody was going to fucking pull cookie over, take him out of the car and slit his fucking throat. Cause everybody that was capable of slitting his throat along that fucking entire road is either in a detention camp or summarily executed. There is no fucking gringo. There's no crowds between fucking cookies, fucking tent and the front line of the war. None. Ain't no krauts in there. Shit's been fucking pacified. And so we start talking about fighting fucking wars. We need to start talking about fighting wars again. And that means securing your supply lines. That doesn't mean that we send an ODA out in the middle of nowhere, give them some 120 millimeter mortars and some heavy ass MRAPs, and then tell them to drive through Indian country to conduct a KLE and get shot at going in and coming out. That's not securing your supply lines. Near peer war, mega cities, supply lines will become mandatory. Mandatory. We're going to go right back to tenants of fucking maneuver warfare. Dust off Rommel. Shit's in there. So that goes against what we were talking about or what you were saying about 556 would be superior in a mega city. That's kind of <laughs> funny how everything kind of goes back and forth. No, I, I I think that having a 7.62 gun will be like Jack said, you're going to be fucking out of ammo by noon. Having a 5.56 gun, you're going to be out of ammo by 1,600, and you're only going to have to have your fucking bayonet or your fucking SIG pistol out uh, for an hour and a half before fucking Cookie shows up in the LMTV with the two uh, fucking MP ASVs and fucking security dumping off your crates of ammo for the next city block. Well, tomorrow, as you look at your pallet of ammo stacked waist high, we're going to try to get to fucking 2nd Street. Awesome. We're calling it Phase Line Douchebag. Sweet. All right. Clear every building left side of Phase Line Cores up to Phase Line Douchebag. Well, we know what we're doing tomorrow. I'm going the fuck to bed because I'm an NCO, private snap link. I want you to fucking put some CLP in your rifle and pull security all night long. Go. Like, <laughs> that's going to be the next floor. What the fuck? I yeah, I mean, it's like, I mean, we, we've been working rips. You know, they revolved around, like, multiple month deployments. A real rip is, like, 40 minutes. You mean no continuity books or anything cool like that? No cool PowerPoints to hand off and... Right seat, left seat rides. No, we do that. We have to do that. Right? Right? Where's the fun? <laughs> Where's the fun in not doing that? You're prepping for prepping for redeployment four months out. You know, it's awesome. Dude, my PowerPoint transitions are on point. <laughs> I did a relief place, yeah. uh, relief in place with the Marines in 1993 out at 29 stumps. And uh Deuce was up. <laughs> He's got a flak. He's got a flak open, and uh, and his deuce gear on. He's wearing some fucking Ray Bans, and he shows up with this M60 Echo Three. And I've got my 60 on tripod, my range cards out, uh, my fucking um, lit 937 night vision scope still mounted, but I've got the daylight cover on because the sun had come up. And I start talking to him about underlying folds of the earth. You know, he like shows up. He's like, "Hey, we're supposed to uh, uh, rip out with you. I'm the gun that's going to rip out with you." I was like, no problem. I started talking about the range card and the adjustments on my T and E to be able to see and uh, and what the lighting conditions are going to look like and the photonic barriers once the sun goes down. And this fucking devil dog looks at me, goes, 
He goes, hey, 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 stop, 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 stop talking right now. He goes, there's only one set of night vision in the entire platoon. LT's got it. It's a PVS-4. And I was like, okay, all right, disregard all the night vision shit. Where's your tripod? I'm going to leave my shit locked in here. Give me your 122 and I'm out. And he goes, shit, Sark, we ain't got no fucking tripod. I was like, well, you're not taking mine, then fuck you. <laughs> so doctrinally perfect, worst actual relievement plays ever. <laughs> So with that in mind, next week at 1800 hours, Mountain Standard Time, we will be discussing the United States Marine Corps. Seriously, that's our next scheduled topic. Jack, are you in? No, I'm, I'm fucking completely out for that shit. Um, <laughs> where, where, where's my, where's my permamute? You mean for you or for someone else? <laughs> No nah, man, like I, I feel, I feel bad, like being bad, like like talking shit on my mom, like my hand. I, the amount of insanity, like like Chuck's like like right next to me, like like I can, I'm like touching him like right now, and like dude, like not enough whiskey, man. Yeah. Oh well. So you know, seven six two battle rifles, they're gonna be a thing, and we'll figure it out, and. We'll learn some lessons and we'll probably spend a lot of money along the way. And, you know, it is what it is, guys. Well, the good news is it's going to be a good gun. Uh, seeing it, seeing the building on the requirement for it, it's, it's going to, they're going to have to bring their A game. Just like, just like with the pistol. Um, like I said last week about the pistol, it is going to be a good pistol. <laughs> Jack's not convinced. Um, but, it, it's going to be going to be a fairly good rifle. It's going to have you know decent glass on it. It's going to have you know some stuff, and at least it's not just every Joe Blow piece of shit gun builder is going to be able to show up. Um, I was surprised that the that the bull pups weren't accepted. So and there, there's some wording in there that it's not going to be a bull pup this time. Um, so that that's kind of kind of some good news, but. Of, of the guys that could probably pull it off, you know, it, it, it'd probably be a decent gun for what it is. You know, it's, I'm not motivated for it at all, but it's still going to be still going to be a pretty pretty decent gun. Hey, uh, Jack, 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 like the pistol, so you can go ahead and uh, hold off on sticking that thing in the freezer. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, we just got a new freezer at work for such things. Be interesting. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, like, like I'm gonna come out. I'm, I'm gonna come out as like the, the like, like closet transsexual. I really like shooting seven six two gun and stuff. If 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 ammunition supports the mission, there's a really strong possibility of having a really cool gun ammo combo come in the problem is that if i separate myself from the let's make an awesome gun side and go into the i'm now going to equip one of my dudes with it and or i'm going to carry it because it's an awesome gun and now i'm going to go do war with it man like that thing just becomes really different than what a lot of people really want out of it and that's really where I kind of, I kind of get my, 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 my conflict on what this thing does. Like, I'm making a gun to win it. Don't get me wrong. I'm gonna make the best gun I've ever made. I'm gonna put up on this, and I'm gonna go head to head with the other best manufacturer in the world to win this thing. You know, and a cool gun's gonna win it. But man, when it comes down to carrying this gun, like, like. I've seen Mark 11. Like, I mean, I lived through that. I mean, like, I've, I've seen all these programs that were awesome ideas, like Mark 23. Man, what a great handgun. Boy, that thing's great. It does all these things. But once I actually put it in my hands, this is longer than my M4. You know, like, it's, it's, it's that separation between concept and user reality. And user reality requirements and the winning item are way too often three entirely separate things. So, I mean, we've been clowning on the gun and we've been talking about this and that and whatever. 
you know, those of you that under that know a little bit about, uh, you know, my Ranger platoon and their and their battle uh, upon upon Taker Gar, uh, you'll you, you'll know that that there was a machine gun fight that occurred, and that, that the enemy was in excess of 400 meters away, and that the original M68 was not bright enough for the environmental conditions. Uh, the aim point in its brightest setting was completely washed out by the snow. So even my good marksmen, my my non my NCOs that could fucking shoot, I, I got a guy took a fucking headshot at 80 meters, uh, you know, 10 seconds after getting shot in the back with a PK machine gun and took the top of this Chechen's head right off. Uh, you know, my, my boys were shooters. None of the M4s were in the fight. They basically, everybody sat down. Three uh, out of four saws were down. Um, so there was there was two two forties. It was two two forties and 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 a saw against whatever the enemy had on the other range uh, on the other ridge line in terms of rockets and fucking belt beds. Um, so during uh, you know post assault procedures discovered the Americans that had been killed. And one of those Americans from the previous gunfight, uh, individual from the Air Force, had an ACOG equipped M4 suppressed that had a jammed Beta C mag in it. So after they uh, secured the, the jammed Beta C mag from the malfunctioned rifle, which was around the dead airman's uh, body, um, they brought the rifle back down. They actually, we actually had to send a runner up through machine gun fire to run and, and retrieve this rifle and then bring it back to the rest of the force so that my seasoned non-commissioned officer squad leaders that didn't really have any squad leading to do because they were, they were fucking, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Spectators. They were spectators in a machine gun battle. Let them get, let them get a chance to get some. And so one of my staff sergeants took this, uh, ACOG equipped M4 and joined the machine gun fight. So, you know, all, all clowning aside, uh, th there's been comments on, on the thing about, I would never, I would never delink machine gun ammo to give it to a rifleman. What's the fucking point in that? Well, if the rifleman has the optics and the accuracy to, to finally place that semi-precision fire, once you've identified where it's at, it's not hard to see where a PK is coming from depending on how well they've dampened the muzzle blast or whatever, um, and whether or not the dude's running tracers and, and all that other stuff. But, you know, if you've identified a machine gun, but you just can't get him because your beaten zone doesn't support it, because you don't have a tripod, because you're firing it like a teeter-totter off of a boulder, your 240 beaten zone is in excess of what it needs to be to, to, to effectively hit this guy. So... That's where a weapon that can reach out and do machine gun business, but in a precision manner, has a place. Uh, uh, you know, we talked about, well, there's never been doctrine for a squad designated marksman until the striker brigade. Yes, because we knew we fucking needed one, and getting the army to change its task organization was about fucking impossible. So the striker brigade was the only new MTO, and it was... No shit, out of the box. It was the flavor of the week, and all the money was going to the fucking striker brigade. So why not throw a fucking Mark 12 on the Bravo team rifleman? It was a blank slate. It was a chance for the infantry to right a wrong. And that's where the SDM came from. And unfortunately, we didn't take those lessons learned, incorporate them back into the schoolhouse, modify the TO&E of all the other units to incorporate this new capability, and then fund a program of record of equipment to support that guy. We bought commercial off the shelf through Crane, fucking Mark 12 rifles uh, through the Crane external sales program. And we chucked them at that very first SBCT that was stood up. That's that's where this, this came from. So I don't know if the squad designated marksman guy, um, you know, if is it is it evil for it to be the fucking squad leader? Uh, is it evil for the gun to be 762? Is it, um, you know, is it evil if it's 5.56 five, but has a fixed power fucking four, you know, whatever? I don't know. Um, you know, but much like the 203 Gunner's grenade launcher, that's what that guy should be trying to do in, until his tool doesn't 
fit the niche. You know what I mean? And, and then he goes back to just being a regular rifleman guy. And so SDM guy in my mind should be looking for shit that other people can't shoot or looking for shit for everybody to shoot at if he can't shoot it with his superior optics. And, uh, and then we just find a platform that does that. We let's, you know, we just, uh, we, we just do that. And, um, so I'm not, if, if you told me that, that, you know, everybody's getting a fucking OBR or everybody's getting a fucking 110 K or everybody's getting, uh, whatever that sick gun was that won the can soft fucking trial. Um, and they all work. Um, if any of those three, if all of the examples I just used worked, um, I would be happy with the performance of any of those three weapons. And, and frankly, the weight, I would be okay with the weight of those, um, to, to have that capability. I just don't believe that every infantryman is capable of that capability. Therefore we're, we're taking on weight that we don't need. That's my, that's kind of my final thoughts on it. I'm, we've been bashing the shit out of, of accuracy and 600 and all this other stuff all night just because we hate the soldiers load a piece of it. But my men lived through gunfights where a magna, a single, single magnified fucking optic made the fucking difference. So I, I don't want us to lose sight of that. Dude. I mean, how many times did you say, it? look, see, like you're not in the fight that you can't see no matter how much you want to be, no matter how enthusiastic you are. If you can't see the fight, you can't see the results of your effectiveness. You are not a participant and like optics leads this charge. And, and I, I like, that's not what I do. I mean, well, other than night stuff, but you know, like, it's 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 so crucially important to have people ability to see what's happening to see the effect to spot stuff to call things out to work as a team like the optic the optic really is the crucial part of everything that's going on whether it's the day or the night you know your 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 perception of what you're bringing from the battlefield means way more than than what caliber you're throwing randomly down range And the NCOs are going to figure out the TTP, uh, TTP piece of it. The officers are going to figure it out. Uh, the, the master gunners are going to figure it out. We're, we're going to get out there. You know, people keep talking about our soldiers can't fucking, uh, you know, uh, Ray was talking about soldiers can't fucking judge distance. I completely agree with him. But if I look in my manuals, maximum effective range of an M203 grenade launcher area target 350. Max distance, 400. Huh. Hey, I think that guy's 300 meters out there. Oh, do you? Grenadier, super elevate. Boom. <sighs> that blew up in front of him. That's 400 meters, dickhead. How much further beyond that explosion is that guy? Oh, he looks like he's like another 100 meters. All right, why don't you put five on your scope and let's get him out there. Like, I, I just came up, I just pulled that one right out of my ass, you know? So... Joe, Joe's going to figure it out. Uh, if you've got smart combat leaders out there, you know, I did, I just told every, every, you know, NCO in the United States army that listens to this, that you have a range estimation tool to mark 400 meters in your battle space. And it's the maximum range that your 203 low velocity round will fly. I've done that in video games. The exact thing. Rip a 203 off. Just see how far that, that, that four or five, that 400 yard mark is. And, all right, let's. Now we and know what that, we're dealing with. And that big, slow, heavy, fat cross section son of a bitch is probably going to be susceptible to a little bit of wind. So if you've got some really squirrely shit where the soldier feels right to left on his face and you fire this thing and it doesn't do its normal gently rotate into the right, it like, whoa, shit, that one went in the lumber yard. Uh, so now we know that down in the valley between you and that guy, there's something going left to right. So, Joe, stop feeling the breeze on the right side of your face, which is probably me screaming at you to hit this fucking guy and trying to, trying to hold off to the right for that because you've got a gale force down there somewhere. And uh, so, so if we're just going to magically start holding off in space, hold off in the left side of the space. Just throw a smoke out there, you know. 
Yeah. Two or three smoke. Okay. Now we got a brain carry. flag. Yep. Unfortunately, we don't carry uh, enough ammo for that weapon system because of its crappy lethality anyway. Uh, when you start talking about specialty rounds, um, those are really, really, they're hard to come by in the field. And uh, a lot of people don't carry them. I carried my grenade launcher with almost all specialty rounds and very little HE because I had such um, a lack of faith in that system's uh, lethality. But it did other things for me. So uh, I, I carried it and used it to do those other things. Dude, I would love a, pop a podcast on 40 Mike Mike just from the misinformation that people believe about that thing like like i'm looking I'm, look, I'm i'm looking at your eyes right now like that it's it's an amazing topic i mean just going from you know indirect fire i mean 60s and 81s um you know what that actually does in like a, a real terrain and what people think of 40 mike mike does and the real value of that system um uh direct kinetic effect way way more important way more important um yeah. And, and, yeah, we, and, we, we've covered it on about three different modcasts. Uh, we got into it pretty good in um, the last one or two squads, uh, two, two ago about squad supporting weapons and organic squads. We talked a lot about uh, task organization, things like that. So, like, go back and look at, like, 104, 105. Is that right, Prime? Somewhere in there? They're about uh, so. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah and, and everybody knows that the, the kill radius sucks. Everybody knows that if we get away from the traditional fuse design, uh, and go to piezoelectric, we could potentially put more frag and more ass in there. If you could stretch the effective, uh, I, I won't even say kill, the effective hit radius uh, of, of frag to 10 meters, if you could put one within 10 meters of a human being and have a high probability that you're going to put a BB in his ass, I'd be happy with that. Like, uh, and, and, and hopefully it's the golden BB. It goes right in the carotid artery. He looks at his buddy and his shit's going like this. And you're like, fuck yeah, hit that motherfucker in the neck with a BB. Um, nah. <laughs> 203 will off. not do that. 203 will not do that shit. Just got, just got confirmation from the studio. 105 was the episode. Yep. Uh, speaking of which, next week will be Marine Corps. The week after that is going to be Jungle Combat. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm serious. It's... Yeah, there was actually a demand for it where we're going to talk about the IAR and similar things. And also the history on how they kind of always got the recycled stuff. But after next week, we have Jungle Combat. And after that, we can we can do the sequel to uh, Squad Support because it sounds like the guys have a lot more talk or a lot more to discuss with that. And we can hit uh, 40 millimeter on that even more so. Nah, fuck so, 40 millimeter. So does that mean you're going to be on for that one? If, if you ask real nice and... okay. But Marines are out? Okay. The triggering. Oh, triggering. I, sh <laughs> I should get a certain Fallujah 2.0 scout sniper that I know uh, to come and, and speak to uh, the group. But I, I, <laughs> I think his wife would probably bill me for the fucking therapy he'd have to go into from reliving that experience. Not, not that it's horrific and all the bodies and all that. I mean, I'm sure it was all that. Just the fucking stupid shit he had to deal with as part of a regimental assault on a built-up city. As a sniper. Like a triple entendre of fuck and, and uh, lack of support from a chain of command. Fact. All this grenade stuff's got me trying to <laughs> dig up the old... Uh, when they were doing the, uh, the 40 millimeters, they... They were also at the same time uh, playing around with the idea of doing a uh, 70 mil millimeter version of it too. Just for, I don't know. I don't even know what platform that was intended for. But they I had the high low 70 millimeter, like, you know, not a mortar, but like the, you know, the case and everything. Well, we can, yeah, we can jump into that heavy and. The sequel to Squad Support. It looks like people are kind of running out of energy. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, Ash hasn't even said anything about the topic he wanted to really talk about. Which one is that? My my M14 ones. Yeah, just to let people know how you really feel. 
Ah, uh, the M14. It is the a M1A really is gun. a great gun. It is. The M1A is an outstanding rifle. Notice I didn't say M14. Now, the M1A is kind of like a 30-30. It, it worked great in the Indian Wars, particularly when the Indians were using it. Awesome gun. Wouldn't carry it to war. Wouldn't do the same thing with an M14. I played. I tried. I, I did my best. I talked to some some random people. Put it into operation. My little SDM guy was was doing whack a mole on some dudes pretty good. Then his gun quit working, and it never worked again. So we gave him another gun, and then they quit working. And then, you know, I come to find out that the best thing about the M14 EBR is when they put them in the chassis, they get this one minute accuracy out of it because the the crane dudes, the redstone dudes that were in there doing their magic with torques and all this sort of stuff putting it together got this really accurate gun they didn't bother to put a little piece of paper in a box that said don't take this gun apart so we took it apart now we've got like a four or six moa gun that doesn't print anywhere because we didn't get the the torque specs right on a little trunnion thingy or whatever now that gun's built out of um and then so so i asked some dudes in that in that cool building of, of magical stuff i was like hey with m80 a1 could it M14 was like, I'm expecting to be the same way, like 855A1. They brought up chamber pressures and all sorts of stuff. I was like, would the uh, M14 be able to handle it? And they just kind of smiled and laughed. So at that point, I knew that the M14 was going to be a no-go for the anything in the future, except for the wall. That's my favorite gun ever. You know, if it wasn't for that sage, you would just had, you know, fucking fiberglass and walnut stocks. JB welded the receivers. And that's what you would have been rolling with. Apparently, it worked for John Brady. So I guess I guess Brady's just better than me in all things. Yeah, um, those things were <laughs> those things were a mess. But haha, I saw 101st sniper uh, took him to the range, and uh, we stretched out his his Sage EBR, got out to 600, got him on there. It was fucking awesome. Took him out on a small kill team the next day. Iraqi cop in broad daylight pulled a 152 Projo out of the back seat of his Opal and in uniform walked up to an existing IED hole, laser range finder, 87 meters. Guess who had 600 meter dope on their gun and cracked one over his head? First shot. Them 240s didn't fucking go over his head though. Bah! So, <laughs> bah, 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 stay GBR. So we do have a unique opportunity right now. We do have a representative from Knights Armament with us who probably can break down some of the 308s they have available and why these are superior to, at least in their eyes, superior to their, this will I guess, be competition. They are independent. They're, they're better. That's That's you, Jack. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, man. Like, there's, there's like, there's not much to say. Like, hey, dude, like, what do you want it to do? You know, like, hey, gun that shoots 762. There's a whole lot of things that occupy that space. Um, you know, when it's like, well, gun that shoots 762 and lasts 20,000 rounds. Well, that's a much smaller space. Um, you know, I occupy a, a, a very specific space in the industry. Um, I make guns for dudes that go kill dudes with guns. Um, you know, um, so what you want to do? I've, I've got a bunch of guns. I got a bunch of guns that you don't hear about because that's what I get to do. Um, you know, which which is cool. You know, I mean, like I I, I say that half jokingly, but you know, it's like, um, you know, I mean, I'm in a I'm in a really cool space. Um, you know, one like I said, I'm I'm a seven six two enthusiast. I really do. I, I like it. I like the dudes that I deal with. Um, I like what we do. But like we understand what the gun does. Um, you know, and so when I sell a, uh, a, a 14 and a half inch barrel gun that has a direct threat suppressor and that gun, that suppressor never comes off and it's the lightest thing you possibly make that, that holds the accuracy requirement that they have with the ammo they have, um, they're, they're pretty happy with it and nobody else occupies that space. Um, you know, when you go into something weird where it's like, hey, be a 7.62 gun that, you know, shoots a piece of crap round at a piece of crap accuracy at, you know, whatever. Man, that's that's a lot harder to deal with. So as far as precision's concerned, precision options from knights, 
what are the offerings and and what makes what makes them different from the competition you already said the uh, basically the the life it, it can last 20,000 rounds yeah i mean it's you know, I mean, and I'm not going to say that every individual component lasts 20,000 rounds. You know, it's like, hey, there's like little springs. Those things got to get replaced by like reasonable people that understand that like, hey, these are machines. You know, like, hey, you've got to put oil on stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's some there's some cool stuff out there. There's some things that are already in places, um, you know, but uh, some of the things that, that are that are really kind of catching the thing is like, you know, our new 16 inch guns. Um, you know, they got all the M locks and all that stuff and they're, they're really neat. And, um, I mean, really the biggest complaint, like really when it comes down to it, you know, you look at the M110, um, the M110 is a big ass gun. It's got a big ass suppressor. It, it occupies a lot of space. Um, you know, one of the advantages when we changed from 20 inch guns to 16 inch guns, um, was the fact that not only did you really like lose the weight from going from a 20 inch gun to a 16 inch gun, but you didn't have to carry another gun to go actually like clear your way into your hide, which is a lot more weight than people realize. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's a shift, you know? So it's like that, that K1 gun, you know, for people that aren't familiar with that, it's a 16 inch gun. Um, it was brought out of really specific needs, really specific users. And it kind of got cross pollination to a bunch of other places. Um, you know, it's, it's a really neat gun. It's a really cool gun. It's a really expensive gun. Um, and it was uh, like our, our first like cross, well, our, third crossover into that space. But it, but it was a more accepted thing. It was kind of an easier sell. Um, really, really super cool gun and sexy gun. You know, like, I mean, a, a good looking gun gets a lot of purchase. Um, you know, went into kind of some, some improved things, changed the things around, try to make a gun that's more sustainable systemically, um, if not individually. And that kind of gets a little bit of resistance from people that, you know, like, Hey, I'm worried about my gun collection. Is a lot of percent worried about you know an entire locker full of gun collection. Um, when you go into that space, um, it 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 becomes different. But when you take a gun that you know has been seen as one thing, um, and then change that aspect of it, where you know, like I said before, you go from this big sniper system into a gun that I can enter a room with. I can I can actually make entry. I can be a realistic three guy. I can get in, I can get to a position, I can actually do do support from that position, changes how that gun's employed. Um, one of the one of the, the big things when it comes down to in that gun is honestly that the guns that we when, when we sell these guns into user groups, they have access to ammunition other than what is the accepted ammunition. This is like really important. Um, and you know, people look at M1-8LR and, and they get like these these visions of like long range snipery stuff. I put in my M24, it's really cool. Well, that's great until it's gone through like four temperature cycles when it's been deployed, you know, it's gone through like not controlled conditions. All of a sudden it doesn't perform the way it performed before. It doesn't do what it did. And you can go on the internet, you look up the milper for M1-8LR and you can all tell me what you see when it comes down to that thousand range performance. And I'm going to say, it's not what a sniper wants to see out of that ammunition source. Um, and now, is that saying that every that every lot does that? Absolutely not. I've seen, I've had some really great lots on one LR, some really bad lots on one LR. I've had a bunch of intermediate. I've had one where one box does one thing and another box does another thing. Um, there's, there, there is a reason why AB39 exists. You know, I mean, I said it before a couple minutes ago, like, one of the biggest determining factors in having a successful weapons procurement program from somebody is having a realistic ammunition procurement program running simultaneously. Um, and there's some really good ammo out there. You know, there, there's things that do different things better than other things. Um, long range performance is generally not going to directly tie into optimal term of performance. And we have some stuff that exists. Um, that does really good stuff up close. Um, it's not the most accurate. Uh, and, and the concept that every 7.62 gun is going to be a sniper gun might not be the best way to look at it. Maybe it is. Now, there's a big difference also between what happens in a government procurement, a government expectation of performance versus a individual procurement or a department procurement. 
Um, you know, what, what you can do as a SWAT team is different than what you can do as an ODA. It's different than what you can do as a general purpose force. It's different than what you can do as an individual guy with a gun. Um, you know, there's a lot of good guns out there. Uh, you know, like, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to tell you that I'm the only uh, weapons manufacturer that makes a good gun. There, it's, uh, you know, there are good other 7.62 manufacturers. You know, like back in the day, we were the only thing. We were the only game in town. Um, it's changed. There's, there's good other manufacturers. Like, we are in a run for our money. Um, and it's, uh, it's good times. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. Like, I like the competition. You know, I like going head to head with somebody else. I like beating other people. Um, you know, I like it from a, a competitive standpoint. I like it from just a, hey, I'm going to kick your fucking teeth in standpoint. Um, you know, whether I like it or not. You know, I mean, it's just like, that's what, I, that's what we do. You know, um, so uh, when it comes from, from, from Knights, um, there's a couple guns that I'll, I'll, I'll put my, I'll raise hackles over. Um, so our, our APC, which is known as our M1 10 K3, that's, that's a, that's a lights out shooter. Um, and when I say lights out shooter, I'm talking about a minute gun, um, coming from a seven, six, two gas gun, a minute gun. And when I say minute gun, I'm not saying, Hey, I went to the range. I shot 15 groups. Two of them were a minute or under boom. I've got a minute gun. Y'all suck. Um, I'm talking about I've shot 20 to 30 back-to-back -back individual shots on small targets, and my point of impact never exceeded a half minute from, from my point of aim, um, excluding environmental factors. And, and I can go on a huge diatribe on what is a seven, well, what is a minute gun, and it's super fucking boring. Um, but, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, so, so the K3 is, is, a, is a, it's a baller gun. I've got some really other cool things coming in on that gun. Um, an interesting fact is that the government is they're they're ready for another caliber. They're, they're ready for the next thing. Um, and that's really my next fight. Um, that, that's really the next thing they're working towards is, you know, what is that that next progress? What is that next step? And the whole industry is, you know, this is a nice specific thing by any means. You know, this is a what are we doing? And we are going for that next long range effective caliber. Um, the the really hard thing that comes around to is like it ain't a sixteen inch barrel. Like it doesn't matter what you think it is like velocity. Velocity is super important. Like let's go efficient of a projectile is cool. BC doesn't mean anything. If you can't get that, that projectile up above X velocity. And I'm going to tell you that velocity is somewhere north of 2700 feet per second and pretty much everything that's in the, the, the culinary calibers. Um, when it comes, you know, kind of that, that other aspect of like, What's a cool 762 gun with ammo that's really working well? Like let's say, you know, 319, that 130 grain Sost, um, 145. Uh, 145 does really good work. Um, you know, the realistic expectation of a 762 gun really, honestly, between professional users, pretty much 600 meter expectation. Um, you start losing velocity, bullet starts dropping off. You, you're, you're. Your range target becomes like really, really, really fine. Yeah, if you gotta be within five meters on on range target, and in your in your wind velocity has to be within a mile per hour, like dude, like that's that that's in like sniper precisiony, super anal kind of area, and that's really cool. It's really neat when you can predict, you know, individual shot, twelve hundred meters, uh, at whatever. Like that's that's awesome. That's got it. That's that's got its place. Um, Fourteen half inch seven six two really doesn't exist in that space. Um, so when it comes down to that, you know, what we're looking at there, there's cool ammunition and ammunition, you know, much like optics really drives what makes this gun do cool stuff. Um, and it does, it can make the gun really do, do cool stuff. I mean, you know, when I can do a, a body shot on a hog um, and, and watch it drop like a headshot, like, dude, that's awesome. Um, and, and um, so what you're yeah. saying is it's similar to like a formula one car and using gas from the pump down uh, from the gas station down the corner it it's it's a whole, it's an entire system not you can't just get the gun by itself that guy but that's not a very good analogy uh. <laughs> For, formula one cars basically run pump gas okay some okay fine gosh that's why we can't have nice things they had, Jordan they had a problem you know back in the 80s they were mixing the gasoline in the pits and like the guys would come out of the back of the pits with nosebleeds and cancer just 
from the shit they were mad sciencing in the cart for the cars Wait, right there. So you're saying this really good ammo is going to make my nose bleed? What? Yeah, I'm you know, it's it's possible. There's definitely a link between cancer and killing and 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 and, and good performance. And black eyes too, if the scopes, yeah. As you, as you were. It'll hit you so hard to turn you gay. So, back to back to Knights three oh eights. Before before someone me uh, rudely interrupted. Yeah, no, 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 I mean, it's it's they're really cool guns. I'm I'm you know obviously like I am I'm emotionally tied to these and that I have a very unique opportunity inside my lifespan to work in like what like seriously one of the coolest companies that exists. Um, you know whether whether it's the nom du jour, uh, like I get it. You know like it's gone in, it's gone out, it's gone to this, it's gone that. Um, you know, I get to work with some of the best people that have ever been in this space. They, they want to be here. They care about what's happening. Um, and, and all of this, you know, like we, we want to make these the most awesome, badass guns you've ever seen. Um, and, you know, regardless of our personal flavor or what we're going to, like we are here to win. Um, you know, you put, a, you put a requirement in front of me, like it's not my job to argue with it. You know, like I'm here for fun. Like I'm here as, as Jack the dude who likes to shoot guns at stuff. Um, you know, but but when it comes down to work time, like, you know, we are here to win whatever comes out of us, whether it's, you know, suppression on, on, on a suppressor, you know, through accuracy, through terminal effect, you know, and, you know, I look forward to it. You know, uh, I, I've read, I've read the requirement, you know, like, Hey, you want to, you know, pull out a seven, six, two gun? Like, Hey dude, I got you. Just based on looking at potential threats in the future uh, for domestic law enforcement, a semi-auto precision 308 just to me makes a lot of sense. I, yeah. To me that, that should be replacing bolts, bolt guns. We, we law enforcement just needs a, a greater capability and those Knights guns just make so much sense in that application. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm outside of like some, going out. you know, I'm, I'm sorry, Jordan, I'll come back to you. I promise I won't go out too much. Um, you know, like there's a, there's a lot of cool guns, you know, like I'm not, I'm not going to stick my nose up in the, in the air. There's a lot of really good guns out there that will hang along with this. Um, domestic law enforcement is a completely separate issue than what you're seeing in the military sphere. Um, you know, from application, um, it's, it's also a different user and, and as much as we want to like do that crossover and everybody wants to villainize, you know, our police force becoming more militant. Like they're not, they're, they're way more judicious. They're, 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 they're far more concerned about, you know, uh, a backstop effect, um, you know, to the fact that, you know, even certain projectiles, certain rounds become a limiting factor in what we can do from an engineering standpoint. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But the ability to, to put accurate fire on potentially multiple targets, I'm just looking at the horizon and also taking into consideration the uh, what's going on in the world and prior training. Jordan? Basically that, you know, you, you, the domestic law enforcement, you don't expect to, uh, you know, be playing that 600 yard game. Right. But something that hits a little harder and can be counted on not to shoot, you know, you know, some hostage or something from a hundred yards or maybe even 200 yards. Okay. Yeah. Now we're talking. You know, yeah, you've got to, yeah. it's, you know, when you're fighting Toyota Camrys or something, yeah, you may need something a little bit bigger to five, five, six. And Mumbai and Beslan and everything else, you know, it's, it's due to come here. Well, I mean, it's, it's the thing that, you know, what the 762 gives really is intermediate barrier performance. You know, like when it comes to glass, when it comes to vegetation, when it comes to all those, those things that happen in real life between you and the target. It's cool. Helps a lot. And also as law enforcement, we're not going out, well, at least at this point, not going on patrols for long periods of time and worried about supply lines. We create a perimeter and go from there for now. Yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of it, once again, comes back to optics. And, you know, and I think it's a really interesting conversation. You know, it's like I talk to guys, you know, from from the the super cool optics guys, you know, in, in all the lead areas of like, hey, what do you sell where? Because, hey, like, I've got to orient my product. You know, like, I don't want to put an optic on a gun that doesn't match with the guy that I'm going to go up and show it up to. 
know, so so that's it's a consideration when I come into, and it winds up in a bunch of conversations. A lot like this, um, usually a lot less alcohol. Um, but so you know, like I'll I'll get a recommendation of, hey, like we sell this. This is why. So where it's going from, you know, and it's like, hey, man, like like the the optics people are your target engagement specialist. They're the guys you listen to when it comes to these specialist units that really know what they're talking about, that really know what they're oriented to, and there's a reason why second focal plane optics excel in law enforcement, um, you know, and, and falls completely out of favor once it comes to, um, uh, you know, differential range targets and, and military application. It's something, it's different. Um, it, it requires a little bit of appreciation and, and it's easier through that, like that big thing, like, ah, that's bullshit. I know this, this is what I should do. This is what you guys should do. Everybody should do what I do. Hey man, it's not that way. Hey Amen. Well, should we wrap her up or does anyone have any further things like Ash has something yeah. groundbreaking he needs to say? Well, there was a question on here about uh, airborne operation considerations. Um, being, being a former sniper section leader in the division, I uh, we had one method of um, getting the gun into the fight. And that was that the rifle had to be jumped, buttstock down, barrel up in the modified 1950 weapons container. That way, when uh, the weapon was released and lowered down with the rucksack and impacted the ground, the, the buttstock of the M24 sustained the 22 feet per second jarring impact uh, prior to the, the gun rolling over. If you jumped it barrel down, uh, especially if you're doing something like an airfield seizure, and you hit the ground, if you hit the ground hard enough, there was a chance that your weapon could actually spear through the bottom of the 1950 weapons container and destroy the crown of your muscle. I've seen an M60 machine gun where the, the flash hider on the 60, which is the same as a, a Mag 58 for those of you that don't know, it was full halfway with uh, runway. It had punched through a weapons container and then like, like a core thing for an apple it had taken the asphalt from the runway out and plucked it out with it now apply that to a precision sniper rifle barrel yeah that's where you're at problem with keeping it jumping it buttstock up is that if you were unable to ditch the uh the rifle and have it go down the lowering line when you uh did your parachute landing fall if the wind was blowing from your right to your left you would land and roll on top of your rifle and the chances of you jacking up your free float and your gun no longer being free floated in the stock was uh, increased. So um, I jumped my guns as little as possible. The entire time that I was the sniper section leader and we went to the Joint Readiness Training Center, uh, I volunteered the uh, entire sniper section for uh, ADVON duties so that we could go and pull all the shit details prior to the deployment and then be pre-positioned on the drop zone because I knew that my miles gear had to be zeroed. And if I jumped in, I'm already starting the, the gunfight with an unzeroed weapon. And miles laser beams don't have any type of splash or ballistic wake or anything that you could tell to adjust misses off of. So uh, we would suck it up and unload Humvees off of railheads and pull every shit detail that the division had for us to have the benefit of being in our kill tops standing there holding our rifles in a holding area until the first pass of paratroopers were on the ground. And then somebody giving us the ominous dominus, all right, you guys are now tactical, go. And then we could like run off in the woods and shit. So I never had to worry about somebody running up and giving me two in the face on the drop zone uh, during the time that I was there. And I preserved the service life of my M24 uh, systems, which at the time were running that fucking mirror pivoted fucking Litton um, PBS 10, eight and a half pie. So that, that, was, that was my night vision optic, was this fucking night vision scope that had a, a fucking rotating mirror prism in the middle, something that you really want to you know, hit the ground with that hard. So um, at that time, we were also doing a lot of combat light work. So we were going without rucksacks a lot. We were using assault packs and things like that. So I came up with a technique of using the Eagle multicam drag bag as a ruck and carrying the weapon, the rifle in there 
and then an M4 in your hand so that you could conduct a break contact uh, drill if you had to. And then all of your lickies, chewies, poncho liners, sleep shirt, whatever, all your combat like gear was stuffed in the drag bag. And it worked awesome. Problem was, how the hell do I get a drag bag on the ground if I have to jump my weapon inside of this modified 1950 weapons container? So I was the one that got the 82nd Airborne to approve jumping the sniper rifle in the Eagle drag bag, wrapped up and encased in the same uh, container that you put, uh, the jump pack that you put an AT-4 missile in. But instead of putting the AT-4 rocket in there, you put the drag bag with the sniper rifle in the middle and you wrapped it with all that heavy-duty nylon straps and all that shit. And I had the uh, uh, Advanced Airborne School at Bragg sign off on that and had it added to the Division ASOP. That was part of my PCS Meritorious Service Medal from Petraeus was that I had gotten uh, AT-4 jump pack approval for jumping in the M24 system. So since then, I've seen a lot more acceptable, jumpable options for those guys. And I, I think that uh, with our free-floated systems and us going away from these exposed barrel platforms, uh, the chances of us doing you know, really significant damage to our guns by one or two jarring impacts like this are pretty minimal. You're gonna have a hot, you're gonna have a greater chance of knocking your laser rangefinder off if you've got one of those on there. Uh, you could potentially bend the free float a little bit, not to the point where it makes contact, but to the point that your laser zero, if you have one is off, maybe that your clip on night vision sight will now cre create a point of aim, point of impact discrepancy between your day optic mounted on the upper receiver and your clip on NVD that's along the uh, upper rail of the 1913 on the, on the free float extension. So uh, it's not without risk, uh, you know, strapping a, a gun to your body and then, you know, plummeting into the earth is, is never, you know, it's never optimal, but if that's how you get to work, you know, you should try to do it once, uh, when you got to go to work and, and, uh, minimize it other than that. And I think that leaders at every level, if you, if you come up and you give them a precision weapon system that at every level, they should be looking at, at options about, okay, who is going out on parachute detail? All right, you guys take my guns out in the Humvees. I'm making my guys jump their jump packs, uh, and they're going to jump fucking two by fours in those motherfuckers. And all the snipers are going to assemble at turn in point four and draw their rifles when they turn in their parachutes. That is a very, very easy staff sergeant level drug deal that you can ha do at the support platoon level to prevent a monthly or quarterly fucking jarring impact to your precision sniper weapon system. That's that's just my take on it. You know, I left the 82nd. Next year will be 20 years ago, so fuck it. Mike? You're in the 82nd a lot sooner than that. Or a lot more recent. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, Chuck pretty much wrapped it all up. Ash's question to me was, what are special considerations for this gun to fall out of airplanes? My reply was pretty simple. Put that fucker in a cloth case, take a running start because, yeah, <laughs> I've jumped up to 18 knot winds even though the limit is 13. So take a running start and chuck that fucker off about a 15 to 18 foot wall. Take it out of the case, see if it still shoots. If it still shoots straight. Do it repeatedly. See if it still shoots straight. Sooner or later, it won't. Yeah, that's that's what I wanted to get out there. Um, believe it or not, there are some pretty important people that watch these podcasts. I got an email from a cool army person the other day talking about the machine gun one. So there are people that are seeing these podcasts. So they're getting passed around, which is cool. But what I didn't want to happen was, because we're buying 10,000 of these things, according to the internet, we're buying 10,000 of them, and they're going to basically be focused on rapid deployment forces that might be the first guys to go do near peer type stuff. So to me, that spells airborne. So I wanted to make sure that some of that stuff got laid out there just so, you know, some sort of jumpable, jumpable container, because this isn't just the sniper gun. This is lottie dot everybody. They're going to hand this thing out at the freaking little green ramp or whatever y'all call it. And they're just going to hand his guns to him and go, jump it, jump it, jump it, jump it, jump it. And so now all of a sudden, nobody's taking these little little things into consideration that now we got guys, not only do they have a gun they're not familiar with, optics they're not familiar with, and all the other douchebaggery that we've talked about, 
but now they got shit that doesn't fucking work. So that that's just what I wanted to get uh get slid out there. The details. It's important. <laughs> Jack, buddy, uh, I'll jump it for you. I'll, I'll get the robo knees out. I'll wrap these fucking busted ass orthopedic 100% disabled fucking knees up. And, uh, and I, I will deliver the mail. I will deliver it to the ground in a rapid manner. If it can survive attached to my big ass, it, it'll survive. Fucking Chuck drop testing. <laughs> <laughs> the Chuck test. <laughs> well any final thoughts before we sign off or we can continue if people are still here I'm just sitting around wait, waiting for my uh, magic gun part making machine to finish its deal magical Yeah. I think Mike's been asleep for about half an hour now He's really good at that. He can keep his eyes open and sleep and doesn't snore. It's crazy. My mic's muted. You just don't hear me snore. <laughs> well, based on the immediate feedback I'm getting, it sounds like we're pretty much done. So... I guess I mean, I'll go through everyone. It's only yeah. been like like two and three quarter hours, so no, it's only been three and a half. Three, three and a half. That's that's funny. This is this is easy stuff. Wait till we start doing the eight hour ones again. And daily. <laughs> so drunk. True story. True story. And they were good. Of course, though, the, the pauses were a lot longer. And sometimes the screen would just be blank for hours at a time but that's okay <laughs> i'm gonna be so like i guess i'm yeah. gonna be like stephen king and shit everybody's gonna be like that motherfucker did his best work when he was fucking drinking but uh you know whatever <laughs> i don't think so based, based on the feedback from the more recent stuff i yeah it's getting real good reviews um so with our guest of honor jack anything you want to uh, anything you need to plug? Where can if people want to talk to you? How do they get a hold of you? All that kind of good stuff. Well, if you need to get a hold of me, you probably already have my email address. If not, then uh, you, you know where to find me through other people. No, no, seriously though. Um, I mean, uh, netarmco.com. If you need to drop in, say hi. I'm I'm all over the internet. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to talk to people. Uh, I love doing this kind of stuff. Um. I'm I'm a horrible salesman, you know. So so please don't call me up to to sell you stuff. Um, I'm way too honest with that. Um, that that's why I don't do sales. And also, if people do have questions or want to get in touch with Jack directly, uh, post on either a forum or a website or on Facebook on anything primary and secondary, and we can connect the make the connection for you, Adam. Yeah, even though I think I heard you say two things. Yeah. Yeah, just been sitting here in silence, just listening to all the smart people talk. Damn, me too. Nothing to plug, nothing to say further. I'm just just happy to be here and nightarmco.com, as Jack said. And yeah, yay team. Yay team. Ash. Nothing exciting going on. The uh, lowers that we talked about last week. We sold uh, seven of them on the first day. Haven't sold any since, but and this way it goes. Um, that's about it for excitement until the 308 gun comes out. Yes. Your specific one, or just in general? Yeah, we're getting a uh, we're getting a 308. We got our 308 lower scot. They'll be out a couple weeks. Lower and a upper. I don't know what people are going to do with them. I don't know if they'll sell. I'm going to build probably a 308 and a 260 out of them just because I can. We'll go from there. I got to test all this crap that I talk on the internet. So I figured I need to have a 308 gun. So why not build my own? It's true. That's totally, why I bought a bunch of pistols. You should absolutely troll the internet and submit that fucker just to watch everybody's mind. Fucking, ah, ah, like, 
acquisition heresy. Ah, it'd be awesome. Like, and, but like, don't put a blanket after in there. So you fail, but like, just do it just to fucking <laughs> everybody go high. Right. It'd be awesome. That, that'll help everybody with it. With the, these guns got kicked out. They're all pieces of shit. They got kicked out just cause that guy had insider info and you'd already seen the requirement. And you have a, and you have a M1A coming out as well. Yeah, we're going to do that one. Um, it's going to be Cerakoted and like plaid. And uh, actually on my, <clears throat> I don't know how many people saw this, on my pro page, I put out the challenge that when the pro page hit 1959, I would run an entire carbine class with an M1A. Apparently people don't want to see that because I'm still like 752 likes. So I'm, I'm good. I got a long wow, fucking spine before I got to do that class. But someday we'll hit 1959. And I'll be doing it with an M1A. Right. And how so, do people find that page? I'm sorry. Just so you know, uh, when they talk about glass bedding, you don't take like broken automotive glass and sprinkle it in the stock like you're rolling a J and then torque that shit down. That's, that's not glass bedding. Oh, <laughs> man. That's what we just did. <laughs> We're in all the fun. And where do people find the pro page? So they can like that. And you can run that course with an M1A. Uh, Facebook, Ash has pro page. Easy to find. That works. And Jordan. Oh, like Pretty always, enough. I'm off doing my own thing. Just random shit. Making gun stuff. And yeah, making gun stuff. Like I said, I'm going to have my uh, RMR height uh, Ruger Mark IV sights here in probably about 45 minutes. So... Uh, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and then also attaching uh, RMRs to bolt carrier groups. Because that's effective. Mike. Oh, there it is. Nothing exciting and new. Uh, same old stuff. I hear that. Chuck. Uh, you know, still enjoying the rest of the summer, uh, you know, doing the consultant stuff behind the scenes. Um, but spending time with family and all that end of August is when I'm going to kind of ramp back up again and try to run strong all the way through the Christmas, uh, time frame. So, uh, if you're interested in, uh, hosting a class in your area, you think you could fill it up, whatever, um, you know, hit, hit up PNS and with some dates and, and, uh, and what have you, and we'll just have to take a look at it to pace, uh, based on what I've got going on. I will be at Friends of Pat. Uh, got contacted by Forge or Chappie or whatever they're, they're, they are. Uh, uh, looks like I'm going to do both day and night uh, shoot house primer course. So that's going to be a, a Sims UTM kind of intro to... Uh, my training philosophy when it comes to uh, you know room clearing whatever um but it'll it'll it no force on force it'll all be paint on paper and uh it'll be either a single four-hour block day or two four-hour block days and then we have not decided whether i'm going to teach the same shit twice and to to expand to more students or whether i'm going to teach less students for a full eight hours and then roll into a four-hour night block as well uh, which will be uh, a shoot house uh, introduction to knots and lasers indoors kind of thing. So that's that's all my charity work for uh, supporting uh, you know everybody that was associated with um, with Pat and the Friends of Pat event last year. Then moving on from there, I've got to hit up Alliance. Uh, I plan on doing a shoot house class, which will probably be a, be a semi closed enrollment. Uh, and then an open enrollment night vision and laser flat range class that both will occur before the Christmas holidays, uh, scheduling dependent. The shoot house class is going to be five days and the um, flat range class will be probably a three night, a uh, three day, three night uh, event. And, uh, you know, still, still looking for, uh, still looking for other, um, companies to to work with on the consulting side uh potentially working on a pro a pro staff thing with a handgun uh element got got to sort some things out with that uh and then i've got to get 
deliverables and like fucking shoot the shit out of their product because I, I won't I won't I won't shoot something just because they're signing a check. That 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 dog ain't gonna fucking hunt. But I had these crazy ideas about another another Roland build, and uh, if I do not get financially obligated to a company as as a member of their consulting and pro staff, then I'm gonna go out uh, on my own and build my next fucking whatever the fuck it's gonna be. But it'll be pretty glorious. I know what it is. I know what it is. Yeah, I bet you do, Panama <laughs> Red. Uh, and uh, so that's. That's uh, that's pretty much uh, what's going on in the in the Chuck P life right now. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. Um, that that was fun. I think I think people enjoyed it. There was a ton of feedback on the uh, on the chat. This was live on YouTube. It also was live on Spreaker, our new audio streaming thingy. So we yeah we reached a lot of people. Good times. You can find us at primaryandsecondary.com. We do have a forum, believe it or not, at primaryandsecondary.com slash forum. Uh, we are on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Spreaker. What else? Uh, Google Play Podcasts, obviously YouTube. Big thanks to AT Armor, who uh, they were a, a sponsor to the, the this episode, as well as Forge Tactical Training. Good old Chappie and Doc Spears, who I, I look forward to seeing again over at uh, Friends of Pat. I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, we have another episode next Thursday at 1800 hours Mountain Standard Time. We will be discussing the United States Marine Corps. Up until then, we will talk to you soon. Bye.